All right. Good morning. Good morning, Kurosh. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We uh, welcome you back to our workshop. And uh, like yesterday, we're going to take a few minutes to, to wait until uh, more of you can log in. Good morning, Chris. Looks beautiful behind you. Morning. That's my house picture. Oh, it's a picture? Oh, it's real. It's real. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's a real picture, but it's not live. Looks like more snow than last Friday. Yes, more yeah. snow than last Friday. Oh. So the mountain just behind you is uh, is the one going to Park City or? No, it's the big Cornwood Heights is the one that is um, near, near Snowbird. I see. It's a big cottonwood canyon. So do you need to have different tires on cars in Utah, like uh, yes. winter tires and yeah, yeah. Yes. Snow tires, yes. Here, I can show you the live picture, but then I have to change my video. Just one sec. Good morning, Shailene. Good morning, Nick. Hey, good morning. Oops. Yeah, I think I, I I almost know everybody. So, hi, Joe. Good morning. Good morning. You see yeah. it? You see yeah, it? we see it. Yeah, oh, we see it. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's Utah. Fantastic. Yeah. It's beautiful. beautiful. I, I think we think it's beautiful because we're yeah. not shoveling the snow. <laughs> yeah. Chris, Chris has so, probably have enough of that, you know. Those of us or you who have young kids, I guess that that would be their dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we uh yeah the the Colorado we we don't have uh, we don't have snow and then like the uh, last couple of days we have like seventy we're in the seventies oh, wow really. and we have yeah. in the forties here it's very strange really in the mornings yeah in the early oh, mornings. yeah in the mornings of course in the morning is freezing but uh, at one point like last week we jumped to seventy I was like this is San Diego or something. But yeah, the, we haven't we haven't been able to ski much. Yeah, the ski resorts are not happy. Oh yeah, lots of lots of business. Morning, Ling. Yeah, hey, Chris. Yeah, Shailing, you an advanced skier or? No, no, I'm a I just a just blue blue. Yeah, yeah, my ankles. I mean, I I think I. I I was able to do some something more advanced when I was a student, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, last summer I was uh, playing tennis with my my kids, and I can't catch up because my knee hurts. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> too too many shake table tests. <laughs> yeah, my yeah, I'm like uh, my entire body is shaking. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you need to make access easier, Ling. Good thing we have those stairs. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if if you Enlarge your table by two folds, we'll have an elevator. <laughs> yeah, I know. We talked about that. <laughs> yeah. Jose showed you. Just stretch it out. He stretched it. He's so strong. <laughs> yeah, the, uh... yeah, I'm, I'm getting another, uh, another like uh, 120 feet boom lift. I'm renting another one. So it, you need a means of exit. So the swinger to need that. But yeah, I think I would be using that a lot instead of stairs. <laughs> yeah, but, but those boom leaves are scary. I mean, I. Take some courage to to go up, uh, you know, five story with those type of things. Yeah, I mean, a uh, ten ten story will be a, when you are at uh, eight story, <laughs> yeah. six, seven, eight. Uh, it's shaking up there, right in the in the platform. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, Joe, do, do you know do you know ET at UCLA? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, they are they are thinking about the putting a uh, um, rapid for deploy some of the uh, cheap um, accelerometers with their own DAC system, 
so they won't interfere with yours. But if he if he found if he got the funded, uh, he he might uh, deploy like a more than a hundred on the building. You know, that's that's good because then then that'll solve a lot of our problem. Yes, sure. And you did you receive other? You have at least one other payload, right? That was already approved. Right, right, right. The uh, the damper one with uh, with MTU at Dan Dalton. Uh, he, yes, right. Yeah, but but that one that one should be quite straightforward. Just some 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 swapping of hardware at the base. So yeah, there are also some interest. Uh, they will talk to you about about uh, a new new generation of GPS. Oh yeah, that that that'd be nice. I mean, because. <laughs> Because after ten stories, I mean, you you have a new tower that's that tall. We can we can pull stream parts, probably not. So yeah, that yeah, we we would like some absolute uh, displacement measurements. I mean, that'd be that'd be great. Very good. So I I think uh, Kurosh, how does it look? We should get started. Okay. Yeah, people are trickling in, but I don't want to keep them you know waiting too long so maybe we should begin and uh i'll okay. just keep posting things in the chat you know for those who join us a little late okay very good so good morning everyone i'm joel conte the pi of the neri experimental facility at uc san diego i want to welcome you to the second day of our workshop annual workshop uh, so yesterday uh, those of you who attended and maybe they are new attendees today so yesterday we we talked about uh, facility capabilities, past projects, and and best practices for writing a competitive NSF proposal. And today we will focus on new capabilities, equipment, future project, and payload opportunities. So let me review again the agenda for today. So the first uh, presentation will be on the modular. A test bed building that uh, would allow many of you who write NSF proposal to to keep your budget. Uh, I mean, to reduce your budget in terms of con uh, cost of the specimen because you may be able to test your device or your 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 earthquake protective system on making use of this uh, test bed frame. So Professor Tara Hutchinson and Professor Chris Pantelides will present this. Then there will be a talk about the tallest uh, payload ever tested on a shake table. That will be tall wood, a ten-story, a full-scale scale ten-story building. There will be three, three. Uh, the PI of this project and and two co-PIs will uh, share the presentation. Uh, then we will have. Dr. Gianluca Cusatis from the National Science Foundation giving information about NSF NERI facilities and research programs. You may have many questions uh, about proposal uh, to NSF for him. Then we will, uh, the goal here was to have uh, some project on, on the uh, commercial side of things, so to speak. So Dr. Elena Kalinina from Sandia National Laboratories and Mr. Nicholas Klimishin from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory will share the presentation of uh, an upcoming project on test, shake table test of nuclear cask and the nuclear fuel assembly inside the casks. And then finally, uh, Dr. Kurosh Lotfiza, the site operation manager uh, will have a presentation on IT resources, cybersecurity, and instrumentation, and data acquisition. And then, then we'll have concluding remark and should finish around 12.30. So uh, uh, let's uh, give the floor to uh, Professor Tara Hutchinson and Chris Pantelides, unless some of you have question. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to add a couple of oh, yes, general please. housekeeping yeah. points if possible. Um, it, please feel free to ask questions, uh, either leave them in the Q&A or in the chat box or, or raise your hand and we can uh, you know, unmute you and you can ask your question. Uh, don't be shy, just ask away. We're more than happy to answer any questions you have. 
Uh, we do have a uh, survey uh, for our workshop that will help us uh, improve our workshop in the future, improve the delivery, uh, the material, the presentations, this whole Zoom environment if we ever have to do this again. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you can fill that out. We'll share the links uh, just a little bit later in the day. I'll put them in the chat and we'll have it on the presentation on the screen so you can see the link. Um, it would really help us out. The uh, surveys are all anonymous, so please be honest with us. And um, if it does have a field where you can put your email address in if you want us to contact you. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll step aside. Thank you. Yes, the, I had forgotten about that. The, the, the survey uh, NSF requires them from us. So would be very, very nice uh, kind of you if you could take a few minutes, even during the presentation, so that it does not take you time after the end of the workshop. Very good. So Professor Tara Hutchinson and Professor Chris Pantelides from the University of Utah, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Joel and Karush. Let me get organized with sharing a presentation with you. Uh, okay, are you able to see it in slide presentation mode? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the confirmation. Um, well, thank you to our audience for joining us again this morning. In this presentation, um, we're going to recognize the early Christmas present given to us, but still remain a little bit humble. Um, that is the X, Y, and Z capability of the table. And as my wise co-presenter, Dr. Chris Pendelidis asked, don't ask what your table can do for you, but ask what you can do for your table. I really love this quote. He presented it to us last week. And I, I feel that it emulates some of our um, objectives with regard to the development of a modular testbed building. So that's uh, the scope. There we go. Um, in this part, Chris and I will share the presentation. Um, but in this part, I'll try to I'll try to give you a feeling for the design scope, how we you know made it happen as a team, some of the features of this modular testbed building, um, including pragmatic design decisions we made, some dimensional plans, some things we think are novel about this, what we're calling MTB squared, some expected performance a little bit about an activity we undertook this fall, shaking down and staging an erection of the structure. And we'll ask the question, is it truly modular? Uh, and finally, we have some thoughts on, obviously we'll be shaking down the structure and performing dynamic tests as soon as LH post six is complete in early 2022. Uh, and the last remark uh, to share with you some thoughts we have on opportunities for future researchers. Um, when we get to novel aspects of the modular testbed building, I'll, I, I'll, this, in this discussion, I'll be quite brief as when I'm complete, I'll pass the helm over to, to Chris and he'll really focus on his, his design work and expertise in the area of the structural connections and their anticipated behavior. That is um, some buckling restrained braces and and, and um, moment frame connections. For some reason I cannot get my mouse to work properly today. So I'm just gonna put it in another mode. There we go. Okay, so the scope, uh, the scope of this reusable test frame, um, we wanted it to be community, a community available building for NERI researchers, be a new piece of infrastructure to sort of com contribute to our shared uh, in shared use infrastructure here at the equipment facility. Um, for, fortuitously, it will be the first structure to be tested on the newly upgraded LH Post 6. And there's been quite a bit of evolution um, along the way. Um, we received community input over near, various NERI workshops. Um, Chris and I, and actually uh, with a colleague from Reno, Dr. Kerry Ryan, who will speak later, 
uh, began this journey actually uh, looking at some prior, building on some prior research and proposals. Um, so it's actually an inception from an earlier proposal idea and spawned from that. Um, and finally, we had a partnership um, with industry, I'll show you in the next slide, which has been very fruitful and helped us evolve and, and bring this, this work to the forefront. So the other attributes of the design scope we held close to us was this idea that we wanted it to be reconfigurable and reusable with low cost replaceable um, nonlinear elements. And, and we also wanted a, a very simple removable floor system for reasons that I think will become apparent. Um, we wanted, we wanted, wanted to assure that it would allow low cost testing of components and systems. Um, in essence, uh, my, my last statement here is really for it to serve as a vehicle to deliver seismic loads and displacements to whatever element of interest a researcher may have on their mind. <clears throat> so to undertake this, we had a terrific team of academic and industry partners shown here from UC San Diego, myself, along with my colleague, Professor Hilberto Mosqueda, whom you heard from yesterday. Um, none of this ever happens without talented graduate students, so I show two of them from UCSD here in the field, Mr. Mike um, Morano and Louis Lynn working hard um, at the site. Um, and it's a partnership, a, a very nice partnership between, between us and the University of Utah. So Dr. Chris Pendelitis will speak next. And he's got two excellent graduate students working with him, Miss Emily Dietrich and Junwei Liu. Um, have been contributing to various activities on this. We were also fortunate, I should mention, to have a summer REU program, the uh, REU student um, who's now continuing his master's degree at UC Berkeley. And I think Chris and I both hope to recruit him for his PhD. He was an excellent student. And as, as many of us, we were remote. And I think uh, Lely mentioned yesterday, our REU program was remote over the summer um, due to the pandemic. But uh, Mr. Zane Schemmer did an excellent job. A lot of the renderings you'll see in this uh, in this presentation are credited to him. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned this is an academic industry partnership. Two of our leaders in industry um, that contributed and continue to contribute substantially to this project are Corbrace and Durafuse. Um, and finally, the complementary federal funding um, we must acknowledge from our. Um, uh, provided by our supplemental, a supplemental National Science Foundation uh, Operations Award helped make this um, effort happen. Uh, and we had a number of additional industry partners you can see here. Um, I put a snapshot here in particular of our erection crew. I think when we were looking for erectors for this type of structure, and, and many of you may have this question, I, <laughs> I contacted uh, maybe 10 or 12 of them, kept a running list of them, uh, shared with them our plans, and th this ended up. This group, Asprey Steel, ended up just being fantastic. They're a wonderful local group to work with, AISC certified. Uh, they really know their stuff, and they really um, um, are supporting the mission uh, of the idea of this being a reconfigurable and easily adaptable structure. And you'll see them in action a little bit later here. So what are some of the design features? Um, yeah, I mentioned reconfigurability. Um, for stability, we decided to make this a 3D uh, structure. It is full scale. Uh, we targeted in on a three-story building for reasons that I'll mention in a moment. Um, we wanted to accommodate a wide range of seismic behaviors of buildings, at least low rise and low rise buildings. So we, we decided on integrating um, a moment frame type of behavior and in that context, uh, shear fuses with plastic uh, to emulate the plastic hinge are supported in the structure. A compliant base to alleviate the moment demands at those beam joints um, and a brace, brace frame type of behavior uh, through the utility of buckling restrained braces. Uh, what are some other pragmatic design decisions we made? Um, <clears throat> I, I just kept a little laundry list here from my own notes and our own discussions. Well, we wanted to go with a, an all hot rolled steel framing system. We wanted to have a simple floor plan. Uh, that, that, that simple floor plan, you know, wouldn't we require the researcher to accommodate any geometry outside of LH post. LH post has its fixed platen size. And so we, we made a, a conscious decision early on to assure that the footprint, the diaphragm that you see here and its ensuing supporting foundation directly fit atop LH post. <clears throat> that would mean, uh, that would facilitate a straightforward tie down to the shake table for future researchers. Um, we wanted to have mon modular nonlinear fuse components as I alluded to the three in the prior slide. We went with three stories. One could argue, why not six? Why not five? Why not one? Um, <clears throat> well, it's, 
you have to make a decision there. It's not too tall. It's not too short. It allows it also allows us to tune the dynamic properties. Um, as you saw in one of the elevations earlier, we can remove we can remove elements at different um, at different floor levels, and and I think it'll become apparent uh, how that would could be facilitated. Uh, we wanted to have a modular diaphragm attached to it, remove from it, adapt from it, and so you see a floor plan here that emulates that. Um, you can see that there's a red region of the floor plan, uh, green and yellow regions of the floor plan. The green and the yellow are steel deck plates. So they're heavy enough to facilitate, heavy and stiff enough to facilitate diaphragm stiffness and transfer, associated transfer of inertial load to the lateral force resisting system. Still give it that gravity. Um, the red regions are a modular concrete deck, <clears throat> which we'll talk about in a moment. We wanted it to be readily erected and stored. That sort of circles us back to an all halt ruled system and, and some of the features that we decided upon um, with regard to the modular diaphragm. Um, so with that in mind, um, just to give you a sense of uh, how, how heavy this structure is, here's a little weight takeoff. Um, it, it, it uh, is, as you'll see, um, it can be reconfigured in a, in, in, a, in a couple of different configurations. The two primary configurations lend you to about 230 kips uh, for the structural systems or 213 kips for the structural system. So they're fairly close in weight and inertial weight just due to the small difference in components that are used for the lateral force resisting system. Uh, with the with the with the foundations that uh, leads us to about three and little over 310 kips and just just under 300 kips respectively for each of the configurations that you'll see in a moment. Let me share with you some of the dimensional plans of the lateral force resisting system. Here's that footprint just for reference um, on the shake table. Um, you can see that one plausible configuration. Um, along the um, north-south directions, and 20, uh, which is a 20-foot bay, just to, again, to tuck into the footprint of the, of the shake table, um, can be erected in a, in a buckling restraint brace configuration and a chevron configuration you see here. The inner bay here is a gravity bay, um, so you see no uh, uh, pure she shear tabs connecting um, in that direction and facilitating the transfer of gravity load to the outer bays. In the uh, the lateral force resisting system in the east-west direction, so left to right in our picture here, um, is composed of two different options. You can see again the buckling restrained restrain brace, braces now, however, spanning over a full, um, <clears throat> a full um, uh, double bay, um, 12, uh, 12 foot stories and 16 foot, uh, 16 foot uh, span bays in this in this case. Um, and a special moment frame configuration is the adaptable or optional um, alteration that one could make that is remove the BRBs uh, and the knife plates that that go along with um, um, with stiffening uh, stiffening the uh, joints and and instead install um, at, instead install um, um, special moment frames. I just realized this uh, diagram on the right is incorrect. Obviously, just the lower floors are the SMF. This happens to be the BRB2 configuration, an alter, a slight alteration, but I think you get the, get the concept here that this uh, special moment frame can be is detailed such that it can be replace, uh, repeated at every floor level. <clears throat> um, so let's talk about the diaphragm a little bit. Um, uh, we mentioned, I mentioned um, this idea that we would have a simple adaptable diaphragm. So composed of steel plates, a series of steel plates, as you saw from the plan view previously, those were those, um, uh, those were those uh, yellow and green regions in this floor plan here. These are all steel plates. Uh, this is a great photograph that my student chose to put in here because you can see the steel, steel plates, four per floor, just over nine kips each stacked up in the left side of this photograph and to the right of it, we're, we're busy preparing modular, modular concrete decks. The modular concrete decks are sort of a strategic size, um, roughly eight, eight feet by about 16 feet. Um, they've been design, designed obviously for their own self weight um, and they can also uh, carry additional load on them. They're um, composed of a, of a vertical form, form lock metal decking and uh, poured in place concrete. So the poured in place concrete gives us that opportunity to attach to the deck. Um, either atop or below, um, and an angle iron surrounding assembly um, facilitates ease of attachment to the transverse and longitudinal framing beams within the structure. So a lot of nice features, I think, thought through for um, this modular concrete deck, two per floor, just over six kips, six kips each. 
So let me discuss the nonlinear components of the MTB squared. Um, there are really three of them, as alluded to earlier. There are buckling restrained braces, special moment frame um, connections, and a compliant base. And Chris will go into the expected performance of these two, as I mentioned. That'll be largely the scope of his discussion. Um, but you can see the um, stress strain response on the left. These are these are assumed profiles that have been derived from experiments conducted at U Utah with the support of core brace. Um, you can see the sh uh, shear fuse capacity um, characteristics of the um, Durafuse um, uh, special moment frames. These special moment frames are interesting because this, this, they're quite simple. Um, the yielding element is a, is a lower shear plate. Um, and so these just need to be removed and replaced. And Chris will talk about those. Uh, though I'll um, just make a few remarks regarding our desire to come up to um, care, uh, facilitate a compliant base. We have two different options that one could run through, that is to fully fix the base as we would conventionally, um, or alternati alternatively to um, install a compliant base through the use of stretch length anchors. And my student, Mike Morano, has been doing quite a bit of work on this, and here's a, a, a cross comparison of what might one might do in, in um, uh, 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 one, what we have done actually for, um, for the modular test bed building, that is use cast in anchors and a series of stretch length anchors. These stretch length anchors run in through a, an assembly of a nut and a plate um, to carry the compression loads and a, and a tube. And that, that threaded rod then is free or unbonded from the concrete as it's installed um, and is allowed to stretch upon instigation of moment loads. Um, so you can see in these plan views a few different options for um, facilitating that action by via placement of stretch length anchors on the perimeter of the base plate shown in uh, shown in blue here, and the very nice um, uh, capacity uh, and uh, elongation capable um, both in the interior base plate and the exterior base plate based on the the needed arrangement to carry. Um, to carry the various loads, bi-directional loads in the exterior case in particular. So let's talk a little bit about the expected performance. These are some um, uh, ETABS model results that we produced uh, of each of the BRB1 configuration, that is BRBs all the way up the height um, in the longitudinal direction um, and the SMF. Um, configuration that is a special moment frame all the way up the height of the structure, and then the SMF plus the compli compliant base um, type of behavior. These series of um, animations are just representing the first modal response. You can compute, obviously, the additional higher modes, but just to give us a feeling in the BRB1, um, we anticipate um, uh, a period of just, just under a quarter of a second. In the SMF, we, we, we are, fortunate, fortuitous enough to almost double that and slight bit elongation when the compliant base is present. Oops. I'll show you that animation again. OK, great. Um, we have two different computer models that have been built of this structure. Uh, Junwei Liu is working with Chris on an ETABS model, and uh, Mike has been working, excuse me, on an OpenSeas model, and Mike has been working with me on an on ETABS model here. And um, so I just show uh, just one snapshot of uh, some of the ETABS models. So they've been cross compared. We meticulously went through that. That was a very healthy exercise. Um, and Chris will show um, a cross comparison of the two models. But um, this uh, nonlinear pushover analysis is useful to show because um, uh, you see uh, the, the expected uh, capacity of the structure in, an, in, in its moment frame only configuration in red, its moment frame plus compliant base, uh, I guess it's in blue, um, it's BRB1 or all BRB in the longitudinal direction in green, um, the transverse bay, which is always uh, restrained presently as a BRB, um, and then the associated uh, first yield instances of each of the nonlinear components. So, uh, some some maybe features from that one could um, articulate from this uh, pushover behavior the, the the as one might anticipate the special moment frame is a softer uh, this red trace here is a softer more ductile response in contrast to a BRB type of configuration um, once the compliant base is added uh, some of the load is alleviated the compliant base does a bit more uh, uh, carries more of the load uh, and satur uh, and saturates. 
um, the strength of the system. So that's evident and that's a, a very nice feature, I think, that could be implemented. Um, the BRBs are amongst the, the stiffest of the four configurations presented here or four directional pushover curves presented here. Um, the BRB1 being the stiffest and the strongest, um, both BRBs having consistent elastic stiffness. Um, um, and then the other remarks here have to do with the performance limits and Chris will talk a lot about this as well. Um, but we see at about 2% roof drift capacity um, at the BRBs, uh, the performance limit associated physical performance limit, which has been identified through the design and, and testing of these BRBs of about two and a half percent is achieved. And at about 4% drift capacity, the SMF performance limit, uh, which is about, again, from experiments uh, conducted by Paul Richards and others, um, that anticipated performance limit of just uh, 0.05 radians is anticipated. So um, the other interesting thing from the nonlinear pushover behavior, and Chris will discuss this, but um, we're able to sort of track a gradual fuse to fuse or floor to floor progression of yielding in the nonlinear elements for the structure. So I think that's an interesting feature for investigators um, looking at floor to floor type of behavior of components. Okay, so we um, are at the point where we have procured, uh, obtained and procured fabricated components. Um, they've arrived at the facility and um, we were ready to receive the Christmas present of, of possibly performing dynamic tests on the modular test bed building. Um, however, there were some challenges remaining in the upgrade activity. So we were able to take some time and perform a, a shakedown of the erected elements we had. Um, and as Joelle mentioned yesterday, we have a staging slab just adjacent to the facility. So this, with a little bit of time, we performed a, I'll call it a, I'm calling it here a shakedown staging slab erection um, between the months of October and November. We, we effectively asked our erection contractor if they would come out and configure and, and exercise um, their configuration skills, erection skills. Um, and they, they, they did that for us, kindly did that for us in the BRB1 configuration um, with about 50% bolt up checks. Um, you know, our aim there was to evaluate the fit up of all components. And we also took an opportunity with a couple of days there um, to conduct some shock tire tests. And so I'll share with you a little bit of that. Uh, the outcome, a positive, very, very positive outcome. You can see the um, erection crew here checking the, the fit up of some of the base plates and thread bolts welded to them. Um, but the outcome of that activity was that it took about one, about two days to erect the entire structure and about one and a half days to de-erect the stru structure. And amongst a, a number of little fit up checks and issues, one very problematic um, issue bubbled to the top. And that was that one of the BRB gussets at the base plate was um, incorrectly fabricated. You can see a snapshot here of what occurred. Um, the fabricator chose to use uh, and not clamp down the base plate. This is the base plate in the lower, hopefully you can see my cursor. This is the base plate at the top of the, which would be resting on the top of the footing, um, which would attach to a gusset plate and then come in and receive a BRB like you see on the left figure here. And so unfortunately there was a quite a bow, uh, both in two planes of a number of the plates that should be attached here. And, and that mismatch wasn't correctable in fact for one, uh, for one of the column locations. So we, we, we required a new, um, a new BRB gusset uh, uh, connection here. So we had the time to get that uh, in the month after the initial erection occurred and actually have the contractor, our erector come out and help us remount holes um, and correct that problem. So now uh, it's ready. So that was good news. Um, you may ask from that exercise, um, did we determine if the modular test bed building is truly modular. So um, I asked one of my students to compose a little video for you. Hopefully it's running properly. This is the erection of the modular test bed building onto the staging slab. So you can see the columns coming in. As I mentioned, this took about, about two days um, <clears throat> with some, obviously some preparatory work in laying out and staging material adjacent to the staging slab. And that same type of activity would need to happen for a researcher in the future. Um, but you can see, um, you can probably see in this video that um, as their um, this erection crew is fabulous, but as they're coming up, um, they're not just lifting one element, they're lifting multiple elements or they're lifting 
uh, full bays, you can see that a transverse BRB plus its beam is brought in together. Um, and in some config, in some situations, um, multiple gravity beams are brought in together or brought in as a unit. Um, you can see the deck flying in there, um, both the concrete deck and the steel deck. Um, so that confirms, oops, that confirms that it's uh, modular from the standpoint of erection. How about de-erection? If I'm a researcher, I really want um, something that is de-erectable quickly because the next project is on my coat coattails and I wanna be efficient about it. And so we, um, we followed their activity um, quite closely as they de-erected the structure. And you can see, um, well, they're not this fast, but <laughs> thanks to Robert Beckley, they're this fast. Um, and you can see they do, they're doing a wonderful job also de-erecting it and sta staging it adjacent to the table. So um, to answer your question, I think that our question, uh, yes, I think it is uh, truly modular. So we're really happy with that exercise. Uh, we also, during that um, erection on the staging slab, um, had the support of the site to perform some uh, shock tests on the structure. We, we Obviously, we don't have the base excitation from the shake table. So you see a cartoon here of how we shocked or excited the structure. Um, that is, we just used a tire. So you can see uh, tire impact tests ongoing here through the use of the crane, um, multiple taps at single locations, um, and, and obviously um, distributing um, high frequency accelerometers on the, on the floor plan of the structure that allows us to collect, um, oops, allows us to collect um, acceleration traces, obviously, um, compute transfer functions. And then we've been performing, this, these experiments just happened. So I just have a preliminary snapshot for you, um, uh, performing some, some system identification algorithms with various input, input in and input out. Um, algorithms that are that are available in the literature. Um, but a nice comparison here with um, um, the ETABS model, you can see the first couple of modal periods on the order of 0.25 to 0.13 and some change. And the system ID, a little bit higher, a little bit longer period, um, but the mode shapes look to be consistent. There's still some geometric issues based on the layout of the accelerometer that my student is working on. But I think right now we're generally quite happy with these shock test results. We have quite a family of them. Um, we tapped all over the structure. So we'll be uh, dissecting these results in the, in the time to come. Um, and, then, and then of course the exciting part for us, I think is to perform some shakedown dynamic tests on LH posts in early 2022. And here's some renderings of um, uh, thanks to Mike Morano for putting these renderings together. He laid it out with some of our safety towers. So you see the nice new safety towers arrayed um, around the structure. And you can see the, the uh, SMS, SMF configuration, special moment frame configuration in the upper rendering and the BRB configuration in the lower rendering. Our, our aim is to, to study and provide information regarding the response of the SMF, the SMF plus a compliant base and the BRB1 configuration. So that means effectively we'll be jumping from this picture to the top to this picture to the bottom. Um, the one significant swap of course is the removal of the BRBs and their associated gusset plates and the attachment of the shear fuses um, as we go from an SR, SMF to a BRB1. We have in, in mind about 180 sensors that the site is reviewing now. Um, an idea to fully dynamically characterize the structure, sequencing it from uh, X Christmas tree, Y Christmas tree to Z, um, and X, Y, X, Y, Z base excitation. We've selected um, some motions which we're running nonlinear time history analysis of using the two models. And I think Chris has a little bit of preliminary response from the Open Seas model where we've been investigating both the Kobe, Takatori, and Northridge Rinaldi receiving station motion as uh, optimal candidates for various reasons. Um, we'll be um, exercising the structure under service, elastic, let's say service, quasi-elastic, and approaching design near, near the fuse limit states. So that's our aim uh, for those tests that will come up at the start of the year once the table is available for us. Let me just end before I pass the baton to Chris on um, a few comments or thoughts on, you know, hopeful or possible future research opportunities with the modular test bed building 
You know, I think myself, I've done some work recently with colleagues on non-structural components and systems. It's a, it's a less studied, let's say, um, but highly consequential area in earthquake engineering. Um, so I, I think there's quite a lot of work to do there. I'm hopeful that this type of infrastructure can provide researchers with the, the um, equipment that they would need in order to deliver those seismic demands to various NCSs. Um, I, I think that you know one of our logics in, in coming up with a multi-story structure was to allow clearly the, the investigation of vertically spanning elements. So you can see here a rendering um, that we put together showing some stairs. Um, you might also imagine uh, cladding or um, uh, uh, Ling was discussing an elevator in his building. Uh, maybe it's a little more manageable in a shorter structure. Um, and the size here of the modular deck could accommodate that. Um, you could also investigate floor mounted or maybe hung um, non-structural components. And that was one of our aims in getting a concrete deck in the middle here. And you know, in that vein, you could think about integrating some kind of protective strategies, um, working with industry to look at their available solutions for roller bearings or slider plates, or even fuse connections, um, stretch length connections like shown in the rendering here. Um, it's not only non-structural um, components and systems, it could be interesting to integrate maybe alternative lateral force resisting systems. You could think about conventional walls, maybe conventional walls with the delivery of loads through some fuse elements. Um, and uh, uh, Professor Restrepo talked about yesterday some work he's done with Giorgio Sempras and Rob Fleischman on, on these diaphragm elements. Similar concept could be integrated here, um, whether it's a single wall, single narrow wall, single wide wall, or a pair of walls. You could even integrate that uh, detail of a, a stretching concept or post-tensioning or others. Um, and it's not just walls, we just, I just show a couple of renderings here with walls, but those could be alternative VRBs, alternative special moment frames, um, just to keep in mind the detailing that's available with the modular test bed building. And, and at the end of this, we, I should mention, we are um, very meticulously trying to document design details. Um, and so they'll be available in the community through the design safe portal. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, with only his hands and a computer keyboard, our next speaker is going to rock your world. I like this cartoon as an introduction for Chris. Thank you, Tara. Um, so let me see if you can see my screen. Uh, I, I don't think I can move up my screen. Can somebody enable me? I, I can't I cannot share my screen. Ah, that is strange. You should be able to. I stopped mine right away. Oh, sorry. Uh, give me one moment. Let's see. Can you try now? Yes. Now it works. Ah, perfect. Yeah, now it's coming, Chris. Great. Can you see it? Yes. You can see. It. Okay. First, thank you, Tara, for uh, doing all the hard work here. And I, I just want to say that yesterday, the first thing that every speaker that spoke yesterday, including Professor Conte, Professor Restrepo, Professor Hutchinson, is the cost of demolition. Well, we don't have that here. The only cost you have is to erect it and de-erect it. And this is why uh, this project, to me, it looks at first that this is just a, a an exercise in, in a three-story building test, but it's not. So actually, this is a, a part of the NERI site. And uh, even though we're showing, I'm gonna talk about here the structural components, which is the BRB1 configuration and the special moment frame. Um, in reality, what we have here is an extension of the shape table. I'll give you an example. 22 years ago, I tested a bridge. To test the bridge, I had to apply the actuator force on the cab beam. So we built a 24 story a 24 foot high, 20 foot long and 10 foot wide steel frame. That was the only way we could actually test the bridge. And I see this as a similar thing. This is a three story building that will allow you to test practically everything you want as Tara showed you, but also with the fact that 
there's no demolition cost. So this should be really a very helpful for researchers. Um, the other part, Professor Estrepo talked about yesterday is low damage. So this is what we try to do here. We try to build something so you can put it on the shade table, but not damage the columns and the beams of this frame. So I will talk briefly today about BRB modeling, Duraf use design and modeling, the instrumentation that uh, we did for these components, and a little bit on the calibration of the BRB and the Duraf use models, and some preliminary results for the pushover analysis for the modular test that building in the two configurations or BRB and, and Duraf uses special moment frame and some preliminary nonlinear time history analysis. And Professor Restrepo said, you need to ask people to do some blind prediction. So this is like a, a blind prediction. So um, these are the two configurations. The one on the left is the real one that Tara talked about that the erection the one on the right uses a little bit of, uh, of uh, magic to delete the BRBs in the longitudinal direction to show you what the special moment configuration will look like. And again, look at these buildings, not as testing the building. This is a vehicle for you to test your components. So actually it is not only modular, but it's also a test bed. And that's where the B square comes from. So here is a picture of a buckling restraint brace. These are what we would call passive control elements. They really are fantastic. They are being used everywhere. You have a steel casing, a concrete filler, and then a steel core. Everything happens in this steel core. And uh, when the core breaks, of course, that's the end. But the beauty of this is you can dissipate enormous amount of hysteretic energy before that happens and it's a very stable system. Here I'm showing you a couple of pictures of what the failure mode typically looks like before core fracture. You can either have weak axis buckling on the left or you can have strong axis buckling. The good news is no matter what you do, uh, these things are unbreakable, unbelievable, and can dissipate many, many earthquakes worth of hysteretic energy. Uh, the Dura frame is a special connection where the bottom plate here, the fuse plate, is the one that has to be replaced. Uh, the fuse plate has strategic uh, connections and strategic bolted connections with cutouts. It's attached to the column, as you see here, at the end of the beam. The, the beauty of this here is replaceable. So many of you are familiar with reduced beam section connections of columns and beams. But of course, these joints, when they have reduced beam sections, the whole beam has to be replaced. The beauty of this Dura frame connection is that the only thing that has to be replaced is the bottom fuse plate. The beam doesn't yield. The column doesn't yield. So this is the beauty of this fuse plate. So here I have some pictures, courtesy of Paul Richards uh, of the Dura fuse uh, company, which is a co-sponsor of this. And you can see that eventually the failure, it's either going to be a fracture of the fuse plates or, or tear of the fuse plate. But this happens at very large rotations, exceeding 0 0.06 radians. In the BRB1 configuration, I will talk a little bit now about instrumentation. We selected, uh, there's a total of 24 BRB. So we selected in the short direction, the uh, 20 feet, of the frame, we selected to uh, instrument six of them with uh, linear variable displacement transducers. As you see here, this will allow us to know what's the strain inside the, the BRBs. We also selected to instrument the core at the one end of the BRB for three of them, and also the gasset plate. The gasset plate is very important, especially under three di directional earthquakes, where, which we're going to apply, and that needs to be, of course, monitored. But this will allow us to, to learn what is the stress-strain behavior of the BRBs. The same thing will happen in the longitudinal direction in this configuration where the bays are 16 feet apart. And again, we're monitoring all of these for one of the bays. 
uh, and we are strain gauging three of them, as you see here. And here you can see the pictures of the um, instrumentation. And I have to thank my student, Emily Dietrich, for doing this. You can see a bunch of BRBs here and the cores. You can see we uh, applied strain gauges on the cores and on the gasset plates. And this shows you uh, how we're going to instrument the LVDTs to measure the displacements at the end of the BRBs. In the special moment configuration, we use strain rosettes. And you can see that uh, for some of these, we apply actually four rosettes and for some others two to minimize the amount of instrumentation. But we are monitoring one bay on each floor. So that will let us know at least what's happening at every floor for these uh, Durafuse plates. This is the bottom plate for each Durafuse connection. We're also using LVDTs two at each floor as shown here on both ends of one of the bays. And this will allow us to know what the rotation is at this place. And here you can see the instrumentation of the rosettes and you can clearly see the bottom fuse plate for the Dura fuse connection. And now I'll get into a little bit of the calibration effort. Um, Corbrace, who is a major sponsor of this project, without Corbrace, we wouldn't have this building uh, they, they actually fabricated this building in Utah and Idaho, and they did it at very low cost. And uh, I have done some testing previously in the lab here at the University of Utah of individual uh, core brace BRBs identical to the ones used now for the modular test bed building. And this shows you a calibration curve, which of course uh, is matched with an open seas model. Uh, the important thing about BRBs is that you have some adjustment factors for compression and for tension. And we know those values, um, they range for the um, compression strength adjustment factor, beta. It's, it's about between 1 and 1.3. And for the strain hardening and for tension, it's between 1.7 and 2. And these adjustment factors were critical in designing the connections uh, for, the, for the building. This one here shows uh, test data and calibration of the model with open seas for the dura fuse plate connections. Uh, these tests were done by Paul Richards and it's courtesy of dura fuse frames. And you can see that we're actually matching rather well all of these tests, which uh, the tests that they carried out range from beams from W21 by 50 to beams W40 by 167. Uh, as far as the BRBs, we've tested BRBs with yield strengths as low as 40 kips to as high as more than a thousand kips. So we are very confident that these models correspond to reality. So that allows us to do pushover analysis. And my student uh, Junwei Lu and Mike Morano at UCSD used two different programs, ETAPs and OpenSys. ETAPs at UCSD, OpenSys here, and you can see on the left, the BRB configuration. We're able not only to match relatively well the pushover curves, uh, but also we are able to match the yielding sequence of the BRBs as you would expect, one, two, three, four, five, six. And on the right for the special moment configuration, we're also able to um, over, or match the yielding sequence one, two, three, four, five, six for the Durafuse frames. Um, and of course, here there is another issue which Tara alluded to, and that's the compliant base with the stretch length anchors. And we're working on that as well. So, in the end, as Professor Conte said, the exciting thing about this new shake table configuration of LH post six is that we can do three dimensional tests of full scale buildings. And this is the exciting part. The question is, can we model this using existing software? So we, we used OpenSys to do a preliminary analysis for the Northridge ground motion RS with all three components. And uh, here I'm going to show you some preliminary predictions of course, this is the response spectra for both east-west, north-south, and vertical component. And you can see where our design 
a maximum credible earthquake fall. And we have some exciting things on, on the vertical axis here. We'll see how that works. We'll, we'll find out how good our building is. And here is some preliminary uh, base shear versus roof displacement predictions for the BRB1 configuration. On the left, you see the longitudinal direction. And this, of course, clearly shows you that this is a BRB frame. And here is the transverse direction. And we're getting pretty good uh, roof displacements, although nowhere close to the, to the limits that were spoken earlier, 2.5% strain. But I have to be honest here, it's 2.5% strain in tension and 2.5% strain in compression. So actually the range of strain of these BRBs before you break them is at least 5% strain. In any combination, it will be three and two or two and a half and two, but you, you need to do a lot before you break these. And I don't think we're gonna break them. Well, we'll find out. And, and here shows you some of the uh, brace force, the BRB force here in this case for the second floor uh, configuration for the longitudinal direction, two base here is for the transverse direction, first floor. And you can see definitely we're getting pretty much what we expect to see in a BRB, at least from the open seas model. This is the special moment configuration. And you can see here in the longitudinal direction, which is a special moment frame because that's where the Dura fuse is. Uh, we get quite a bit of uh, a response here, we'll see. And it, this corresponds roughly to 0 0.03 radians. Uh, our target limit was 0 0.04 radians for the Dura fuse. So we will see if we are able to tear them. Uh, and in the transverse direction, again, because we have the BRBs, we see a hysteresis more like a BRB hysteresis curve. And for the BRB1 configuration here, we see for the first floor, for example, the Dura fuse uh, moment rotation, which as I said, is more like 0 0.03, the limit is 0 0.04. And we are exercising pretty well, at least according to this prediction. And here we're seeing the transverse direction, the BRB on the first floor, which again shows that we have a good response. So these are predictions, of course. And um, I think in the 34 tests that were done LH post one, uh, probably you only had one or two uses of each specimen. You had to build it, you had to demolish it with all the costs. Here, I'm hoping the MTB square will launch a new era of reconfigurable structures. And I don't wanna say this structure is gonna be living there forever, but I'm hoping that's what's going to happen. And with small, small additions, small modifications, I think it could be living there forever. Uh, think of it as an extension of the shape table. Uh, there are many, many opportunities for young researchers in the future to use this MTB square. And as Demosthenes said, uh, small opportunities are often the beginning of great enterprises. So this is all I had to share with you today. I think probably Tara and I are be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Tara and uh, Chris, for a very uh, interesting and uh, informative presentation. So do we have uh, questions from that for them, from the audience? At this point, I don't see any questions. Uh, please feel free to raise your hands, uh, use the Q&A section, or just uh, put your questions in the chat and we'll, we'll get to you. Yes, and if the question comes later during the break, we, we can stay on and you know, entertain questions and so on. So let's, let's move on to the next presentation. Oh, uh, we did get a couple uh, sure. questions pop into the Q&A. Yeah, go ahead, Kurosh. All right, so the first one, uh, there's a two-part question. Will the January testing be online to watch? And the second part is, could that testing be turned into a blind prediction? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a great question. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I, either Chris or I could re respond to that, but I mean, from the online to watch, um, the first part, 
Um, I think our facility has been very good uh, uh, regarding um, you know, distributing cameras. We have one uh, staff completely dedicated really to the IT infrastructure. So um, this is a piece of shared use equipment and we, I'll, we would similarly ask for his help in facilitating um, the opportunity to preview those tests as they're ongoing. So most definitely we'll have to advertise that through Design Safe and maybe ask Karush to help us because he's got all the connections there. So I would say yes for the first one. Um, and the second question is an, is an excellent one, <laughs> Chris, actually. We, we, we have to discuss how to facilitate that. Maybe we have to tap into Jose's expertise. I know he's done this on a project or two in the past. Um, yeah, we're definitely open to that. Yeah, that would definitely be an opportunity. Right. Um, Maybe I'll take the second question. Uh, which components of the modular testbed building can remove, modify, or replace by their own components? I think you, you, you said it very well, Tara. One thing we need to stress is that to move from the special moment frame to the brace frame configuration, we need to use bolted gussets and honches. Right. And those have been fabricated. We didn't show all of them. And those are the only things that have to be done. So yes, those can be done. I mean, we can replace different beams. I mean, the beams probably we could if we wanted to, but the intent was to replace the BRBs, the decks. And as you mentioned, Tara, to introduce walls. Uh, our friend Gilberto Mosqueda wants to do base isolators. I mean, there's many things that can happen with this building. Um, and all the details and components yes. and drawings will be available, right? Through yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think our students, we've been putting some pressure on them, but they've been excellent, all of the students involved with the project about um, keeping up with the drawings. And we have a Google repository now. And as I understand with Design Safe, we should be able to port it from the Google repository where we're sharing things right. to when we're finished to the design safe um, um, project that we create. So, yes. yes. The only other update I think Tara is that uh, it won't happen in January. Yes, to clarify, yeah, our new schedule uh, will be, um, we'll be begin erecting the structure March 1st is what we were uh, just informed. So we've rescheduled the erector to be available for the two weeks during that early March period. Yeah. Great questions. Yeah. Anything else, Korosh? Uh, no, I think we got them all. Uh, please, again, if you have questions, put them in the Q and A or or in the chat, or just raise your hand, and we'll get to them. Uh, and uh, well, yeah. one statement I want to make is that based on yesterday's discussion. The staff at UCSD, Tara, of course, Joel, they're great to work with. I encourage all young researchers to apply for grants through NSF because this is a great team. And I'm saying that because I don't work at UCSD. <laughs> so that's all I want to say. We can claim you though, Chris. <laughs> Thank you for your support. It's a great pleasure to work with this group. Thank you, Chris. Very good. So I guess we shall proceed, right? So the, the next presentation will be given jointly by Professor Shiling Pei, who is the PI of the Tallwood Project. He's from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Colorado State. Uh, School of Mines, Professor Carrie Ryan. She's, she's a professor in the Department of Civil and, and Environmental Engineering at the University of Nevada, Reno. And Professor Andre Barboza from the Department of Civil and Construction Engineering at Oregon State University. He's also one of our alumni. So please, uh, Shailing, the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joe. I'll see if I can share the screen. No, it works. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks for uh, joining us on this uh, um, UCSD side workshop. I 
some background. I, I, I do a lot of uh, uh, large large scale testing, and I work at USSD uh, in the past. Uh, yeah, I just echo what Chris just said. Um, if you have some project ideas, uh, yeah, just talk to Joel, Tara, or Karosh, any of those folks. They're really very helpful. Okay, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the project that's right after the test bed structure. Uh, so um, it's a 10 story wood building, but a lot of people try to ask me, well, why are you testing a 10 story wood building and what is that for? So today I'm going to talk uh, uh, on the project in as uh, a whole, but I do have collaborating co-PIs uh, responsible for all kinds of other aspects of the project. Terry will be talking about the non-structural component because, as you know, the focus of seismic research has been uh, moving towards uh, uh, putting more emphasis on resiliency, the non-structural system is really very important. So let's get started. Uh, well, if I can. So uh, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, so-called mass timber movement in the United States. So basically, uh, in summary, in one sentence, is that people suddenly discover that you can build multi-story buildings with wood, uh, with open floor plan, and very flexible for commercial use. And you can even expose some wood, and you can build those buildings according to the new IBC up to 18 stories. Um, in fact, there's a lot of uh, very ambitious projects like the one in uh, Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin. It is uh, eight plus 19 stories, so eight concrete on the bottom and 19 of timber on the top. So. By the time it is done, it will be the tallest uh, wood building in the world. But um, you can also see from the map, a lot of those buildings are in uh, high seismic region. So what's going to happen when there's an earthquake? Uh, the pictures from a Kobe earthquake. Uh, in fact, this, uh, <laughs> this test we're going to do, there's a little spoiler here. In, in collaboration with some Japanese carpet partners, we're going to actually do some uh, GMA Kobe motions. So uh, since the uh, mass timber building multi-story uh, is new, because before 2021, uh, the code in the US only allow you to build wood buildings up to six stories. Uh, that applies to light frame wood buildings, but because now we're using solid uh, chunk of wood, they are um, pretty predictable on fire performance. So the IBC push it up to 18 story and people are doing it. In fact, there has been some uh, story um, along the Pacific Northwest coast that's uh, been more than six stories already. The question to ask is uh, uh, if we're gonna do this uh, all over again, it's a new thing, we can probably try to do it uh, in a resilient way that is uh, can outperform uh, a lot of existing designs. The um, basic concept of this project is basically combining two uh, very uh, nice invention. <laughs> one, one is IKEA, which you have a, a big piece of wood, you just assemble them outside, you pre pre made them. And the other, other one is the push puppet, which is rocking wall. In fact, those two ideas are actually foreign uh, to, to, to us. The IKEA, you know where that came from, the push puppet and the rocking wall, I think that research started not in the wood industry, but first coming from the concrete industry, concrete rocking walls. In fact, there are some concrete rocking walls that has been tested in UCSD. Uh, so the idea is really we, we build a gravity system with a open floor plan with a, a mass timber beam column uh, frames and then mass timber floors. And then we insert a, a mass timber post tension the rocking walls so that um, the building will be um, designed to uh, be elastic under design basis earthquake. Uh, the, Structurally, it won't need to too much repair after design basis earthquakes. The narrative total per project is uh, um, kind of proposed based on this uh, um, 
a bigger context that uh, we're gonna design a, a de we're gonna develop a design methodology for resilient tall wood buildings. Um, we actually started with some archetypes which I just mentioned, open floor plan. Um, because for, for mass timber buildings, in fact, you can build it or in some other ways. For example, you can use the panelized uh, shear wall which will give you a pretty close to uh, what we call honeycomb type of construction. But this project specifically is looking at uh, open floor plan with uh, mass timber rocking walls. Uh, because this is relatively new, mass timber rocking wall has been tested uh, uh, pseudo, pseudo stat dynamically in reverse cyclic uh, condition back in New Zealand, but uh, it has never been tested on our shake table. So we figured before we try the uh, 10 story <laughs> full scale building, we do a two story uh, first to uh, look at its performance. So that's what we did at UCSD uh, about, uh, gee, now it's uh, four years ago, <laughs> how time flies. Uh, but this is another um, kind of a um, uh, suggestion uh, is uh, you can, in one project, you can actually use the, the UCSD site twice. So <laughs> you can do a small one and you can do a big one if the, if the timing and the table uh, has space. So this is a um, test structure we did in 2017. I call it a appetizer or investigative testing. Uh, this is just to give people some ideas of what this rocking will look like. Uh, in this video, I'm just going to show to you uh, to to prove that we can withstand a design basis large earthquake uh, without any structural damage, we run the Northridge earthquake at Conoco Park Station, which is a pretty pretty intensive station. We run it twice in a row, and then we compare the responses. And to prove that uh, the building is not damaged, the response responses they match uh, pretty well. But you, you can see it uh, here from the video. That's the first one. You can hear a lot of squeaking, and that, that's what the wood building do, but it is very safe. We identify that if we can just keep running that north ridge like, you know, four or five times, we got the essentially the same result. In fact, uh, what we did is that we actually run some MS, MCE plus uh, earthquake that is actually more intense than what I showed you. After 14 large earthquakes, uh, the building was taken apart. And we look at the damage on the wall, uh, really all you have is a little bit of crushing on the toe of the corner of the wall and some chipping. But uh, I personally look at the residual drift. I think uh, except for the very last one where we yielded uh, the PT bar using an MCE plus earthquake, uh, for, for, for all the earthquakes, the building remains plumb. Uh, so we, we know it's working. So now we're we're moving towards a ten-story design. And as uh, uh, all the audience, probably good structural engineers, you all know, uh, uh, going from a two-story to a ten-story, uh, it's uh, not simply just uh, time everything by five. There's a lot of uh, very interesting dynamic behavior that we are expecting to uh, experience appearance by the building, and then we have to design for such as higher mode uh, effects on the wall panel itself. But uh, we are fairly confident that uh, we're going to uh, replicate what we have on the two story and the 10 story, which means we're going to test it under multiple large earthquakes, and then we're going to expect essentially a minimal uh, structural damage. Um, and uh, 
even if we say something, it will be very easy to repair. Uh, the building is a good opportunity to actually showcase a lot of mass timber materials. I know this is more of a wood industry uh, <laughs> talk, but uh, it is uh, uh, impossible for us to actually pull off testing a 10 story building without support of those uh, sponsors. In fact, a lot of those wood materials are, um, are, are donated to the building. Uh, the building design, um, we, we, we really, our biggest constraint is the size of a shake table, uh, although this is already the, the world's largest outdoor shake table, but the bigger the merrier. Uh, so we uh, used, uh, used some uh, concrete uh, foundation blocks to actually extend the foundation out so that we can have some patio and some non-structural system on the exterior walls. Uh, in fact, I believe, uh, you know, after we're done, those concrete patios will still be there. I, I don't think, uh, I don't think we're going to take it anywhere if the site want to keep them so that they're reusable. That's fine with me. We have two directions. And so now uh, the, the video you just showed that it's in 2017. So the table is uniaxial. But now, because we have a triaxial table, um, actually six degree freedom table, we have uh, rocking walls in both directions. Uh, they are from different material. One is CLT, cross laminated timber. One is MPP, a mass plywood timber, mass plywood panel. Um, we have a stair. Uh, we, we actually, <laughs> Tara had uh, kindly um, connected us to a elevator company to try to see if they want to donate an elevator to put in somewhere. But, uh, but uh, we, uh, we, we want to actually look at walls for the most part. Uh, the, the real estate on the table is just uh, not enough to get another uh, elevator shaft. So the elevation, uh, as you can see, the, the wall will be a single panel, but we have to slit them together because there's no way you can ship a 110 feet panel on the highway. So three um, segments for each wall. So that's uh, you know four walls, 12 segments. They have to be slit on side. Uh, the rocking wall has a uh, very uh, commonly seen um, energy dissipation system mechanism at the at the side with uh, between the wall and what we call bounding column. Those are the U-shaped uh, steel flexural plates. So from now, I will actually uh, pass that to my co-PI, uh, Kerry, to talk about non-structural component uh, testing scope. And again, I want to kind of apologize. This, uh, we, we developed this model on an old, old uh, um, shake table um, uh, AutoCAD drawing, so show that one one axial, but I have a video later that will show you the triaxial table as, as these. So Carrie, you ready to share screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah, a little bit easier for me to control mine. <laughs> okay. And uh, thank you, Ling. And as as everyone see the this slideshow again. Yep, yep, I can see. Thank you. Um, as Ling said, my role on this project has been the non-structural components. And so, of course, if we, we step back and take um, a big picture overview of the, of the test, anytime you talk about resiliency, you have to talk about non-structural components because an important notion is the ability of the building to quickly recover its function after an earthquake. And that depends highly on the function of the non-structural components. So, our second major objective of this test is to quantify the performance of select non-structural components in the context of functionally re functional recovery and resilience objectives. I have to say a 10-story building skeleton is a great test bed for examining non-structural components. Um, I've had the pleasure to work also with Tara on this project and kind of started with a blank slate. What do we want to include? We, um, we, we made the... Um, decision to focus on vertically distributed drift sensitive components and so you know components that are fully subjected to the drift demands of the structure and we're trying to take this research to the next level a lot of the research on non-structural components to date has focused on um, you know the standard detailing and in this project we're really looking for we're working with industry looking for the best details developing new details etc 
for drift compatibility so that the non-structural systems can sustain the drifts without damage. Um, we're focused on stairs, which are critical for safe evacuation of the building in an emergency, as well as non-structural walls and the building envelope, which are critical for both safety as well as their function, maintaining the protective barrier. Okay, so let's focus on stairs for a little bit. Um, I point this out, there were some very high profile stair collapses in the 2011 Christchurch earthquake. The stairs that we're testing look very different, but it sort of brought attention to the issue. And as a result, um, in ASC 716, some, some new guidance was incorporated for stair design. Saying basically that stairs that are non structural must be designed to accommodate the deformation without loss of load carrying capacity. And there were some, some ideas, some language about how that may be accomplished. Um, for steel stairs, AIC Design Guide 34 took that a little bit further and suggested some details, but none of this has really been tested in a rigorous setting. Um, we partnered with a company called construction specialties that became also very interested in um, addressing the stair problem. Their, their uh, main focus is expansion joints, but they, they started doing research on stairs. They actually did a series of tests at uh, my institution, University of Nevada, Reno, on a state run stairs with uh, a straight run stairs with, with different connection details. And as a result of that research, they developed, you know, kind of their solution, what they think works the best. They called it the drift ready. It's this sliding hanger connection. It slides in the transverse direction and it's, it's, it's hanging. It can also slide out in the longitudinal direction as well. I thought that that worked, worked pretty well. Um, at the same time, they acquired a company called Platform Solutions in Texas that has this modular stair system. These are prefabricated steel stairs that basically come to the site um, pre-assembled by floor and they stack up on each other. So the construction is, is very, very quick and easy. You can assemble the whole stairs for the building in, in a day. Um, it invo involves this channel band framing around the top that ties into the building system and they're incorporating the drift ready connections at the mid landing, the stringers to the mid landing. Um, and HSS columns collect uh, majority of the gravity load for the stair, stair system, so self-supporting. Um, so we are excited to incorporate the 10-story um, stair tower into our, our um, testing here. And I mean, this is gonna be very different because the, the drift ready connections have only been verified on the straight run stairs. And there's a lot of complexity when you start to introduce the, the scissor configuration. Uh, some of the details, uh, the top two stories are gonna represent more traditional construction without the gravity column. So the stair uh, landings hung directly from the floor diaphragm and all the gravity and lateral load is transferred to the structure. As opposed to the bottom eight stories will incorporate the modular stair system and the stair band will be tied into the floor diaphragm. So the intent here is that mainly the lateral load is transferred to the structure. Um, gravity system or the stairs support most of their, their own self-weight. And then we are considering various types of uh, connections of the stringers to the landing, the drift ready connections that CS Group developed, but also other popular connections or connections that we think are being utilized in practice, like a free sliding connection or a sliding slotted connection with a stop and to see how those stack up against the others. Um, you also notice over here so on several floors have these gray, um, boxes around them. This intent here is, is um, to include shaft walls that are installed within the, the stair framing, fire protection walls, and the vision is that they're going to use um, fire, fire rated panels that sort of float within the framing surrounded by flexible fire rated material um, but to create resiliency to those, those walls as well. Okay, pivoting over to our work on non-structural walls, I'll give you a little bit of background information. There has been lots of testing on interior partition walls. We know that they are easily damaged. Um, there has been, in contrast, 
not a lot of testing on exterior skin systems, although some of the principles can, um, can extend over to exterior systems. Um, speaking about interior walls, um, cold form steel frame walls, they composed of a top track and a bottom track and steel studs and then sheathing on both sides. The standard detailing shown sort of represented here on the left is um, the studs are fully connected to the tracks on the top and the bottom. And therefore the, the whole wall feels, feels that movement um, and gets damaged under inner story drift. Alternatively um, is the slip track detailing. And the idea here is that the top track and the studs are not connected together. The top track moves with the uh, floor above while the rest of the wall remains stationary and then isolated from damage. And this has been shown to work fairly well, except you know, in, in isolated walls. But as soon as you incorporate intersecting walls, they tend to accumulate damage in the intersection. And this graphic over here kind of explains why. Um, so you see the in-plane wall with the, the tracks and the studs and the intersecting out-of-plane wall. Under in-plane drift, the in-plane wall will slip, but the out-of-plane wall drifts normally and you, include damage, you incur damage at that intersection, either through closing or opening up. Um, there are some techniques to address that, that uh, intersection damage. Uh, more work needs to be done in that area. It's, it's expensive, the detailing is cumbersome. And perhaps it's more, more worthwhile to address in, in exterior skins where the, the function is um, much more important. So in summary, what we hope to do in our testing, kind of take this all to the next level. We are incorporating a variety of interior partition walls as well as exterior skin sub-assemblies. And um, I'm gonna focus on the exterior skins in particular, because I think that's where the, the, the kind of exciting new stuff is occurring here. Um, that first graphic showed a picture of the bottom three stories. And this is focusing on a single story here, but basically we have four um, corner assemblies, if you will, each is a, is, is a different type and has a different way of accommodating the drift. Three of them are CFS or cold form steel frame um, with um, an, an exterior metal panel. So that's not, not depicted accurately on this one. And the fourth is a stick built curtain wall. Um, the CFS ones are three stories. The curtain wall is two stories. And I'm gonna explain how each of them work. So the first one is an L-shaped um, platform framed, CFS framed corner subassembly. By plat platform framed, it, it bears on the floors below, so basically spans between the floors, and it's going to incorporate the slip track. Two different types of slip track, um, a double slip track, which is basically a nested track, the top track connected to the floor above, the bottom track connected to the studs, and the slip occurs between the tracks. Uh, we tested this one in uh, the Lehigh subassembly tests, and it it works well, it works better to kind of hold the whole wall system together. Um, the industry is also very interested. This is a Semco's um, proprietary slotted slip track. So it's connected to the floor above through these horizontal slots. And the slip is intended to occur between the floor and the track itself. We're gonna be testing both of those. And then to address the uh, drift incompatibility at the corner, we're also working with construction specialties group again, and they have a variety of expansion joints. They're not often used specifically for drift, but they're perfect for drift. So this shows a gasketed joint that we're gonna use for this um, application here. It's designed to accommodate four inches of relative movement in either direction. And um, so separate can, can handle that's about the, uh, the peak of the expected drift level we'd see on a single story. Um, the second sub, sub assembly is also an L shaped sub assembly. It's the, called bypass framed. Rather than um, framed between the floors, it, it's actually hung on the outside of the building. This shows a picture of the connection we're going to use. This is a, a drift clip. Um, it's going to be instead of fastened into. Um, concrete diaphragm is going to be 
fasten directly into the steel diaphragm, or, or I'm sorry, into the wood diaphragm using the unistrut. And then the, the clip sits inside the unistrut and attached to the stud can actually accommodate that relative movement. So <clears throat> this um, system is continuous over three stories and it's basically designed to keep this wall from um, drifting over three stories and isolate it from the inner story drift. Again, we have to address the incompatibility at the corner. We're using another uh, expansion joint provided by the construction specialties group. Looks like a door, basically a big door hinge that opens and closes. Um, and it's designed to accommodate 12 inches of relative movement in either direction, which is the expected drift over the three stories. The final cold form steel frame subassembly is uh, what we call spandrel units and ribbon windows. It's an L-shaped assembly depicted here on the right or the left. The spandrel units are rigidly attached to the structure with this rigid clip. And the slip or the movement is designed to occur at the top of the window between the window and the spandrel unit. So it'll use like a double slip track connection. Um, here, all the, the incompatibility is concentrated over that window unit. Uh, we have two different window suppliers, Inatech window and Winco window. And they both, um, on, on two of the three stories, the windows are going to wrap around the corners. They have a little bit of um, ability to accommodate some relative movement, but not a lot. On the third story, our resilient solution, again, is going to be to break up the window over that corner unit and install one of these gasketed joints that can separate the movement. Um, and the final system is a curtain wall, a glass curtain wall, very different behavior. It's a uh, stick built system, so installed, um, uh, kind of built in place. It's composed of horizontal and vertical framing unit units called mullions. They're usually aluminum in this case. They're steel, a little bit more rigid, and the system incorporates special fire rated um, glass. So it's a fire rated system. Um, but the, either way, the, the way it accommodates the drift is essentially the same, that the, the glass is installed with some clearance between the framing and it's designed under racking the framing deforms, the glass rotates within the framing and can accommodate some level of drift. And for curtain walls, there are um, you know, well-established industry racking protocols and racking tests. Um, our main goal here is to, to put this system on um, a, real, a real structure with all the complexities that, that may occur, like the multi-directional multi response and structural deformation and so on. And, and, and uh, try to assess, are these industry racking tests really representative of what, of what happens in the earthquake? Um, so that's, that's the summary of uh, what we're planning to include in this test. And it's really exciting, a lot of potential uh, advancements and a lot to be learned in the area of non-structural components. Okay, Ling, do you wanna go ahead and uh, yeah, so yeah, just Kerry, please play play this. Uh, this yeah, uh, uh, a video is more than a thousand words, so I uh, I just let you see what the building look like. Okay, go ahead. How uh, how do I? Uh, I think uh, you need to get rid of the laser thing and. Uh, <laughs> I didn't practice this ahead of time. Okay. Yeah, then just uh, and then there yeah, we go. here we go. You okay. got your mouse back. Hmm. Yeah, you don't, you didn't have music? <laughs> yeah, there's some music, but anyway. You can't hear it? I, I yeah, well, it's, oh, it's okay. We cannot hear the music. Yeah, but, but uh, it's, maybe it's, start it's, again with it's, the music. It's, on, it's on YouTube, but yeah. Uh, so, so basically, yeah, we, without music, this will work. And then you can see everything's uh, full scale uh, and in fact, uh, if you know a little bit about the timber design, because of fire requirement, the 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 timber uh, members they have to have sacrificial layers in fire event. So those uh, 
columns and beams, they're about a foot and a foot, one by one, one foot by one foot. Um, so they're actually bigger than what's needed for structurally. Um, it is uh, sized for fire as well. And uh, we, we want to do that to, to mimic the real building. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think summer, yeah, summer will still be a good, uh, <laughs> good estimation of uh, when we're going to start to do this. And then, yeah, we got my, our, our website there. Okay, uh, next one. For the record, I could hear the music, so I don't oh, know yeah, why okay. I didn't so, so, Yeah, there's some current progress. Uh, so <laughs> our, our rocking wall panel, as you can see here on the, uh, on the corner on the down right, uh, down left, uh, down corner, uh, that's a nine ply CLT panel. Uh, the thickness is about a foot. So you can see that that's being manufactured and we're shipping them to the upper left side, uh, which is called the Timber Lab and DR Johnson to cut them with computer uh, computerized tools. And in fact, we already have some floor panels arrived in uh, San Diego. Uh, so on the top right, uh, you see some CLT floor panels from Europe. And then on the down there, you see some uh, GLT, which is glue laminated timber panels, also from Europe. And uh, those panels, can you imagine, they, they stayed at the Long Beach port for almost two months before we can unload them. So, but anyway, we got them. And thanks for Karosh and his crew to unload them. Uh, okay, next one. So the we we're, we're starting right now to uh, procure material and start shipping everything in. We 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 are gonna get a majority of our construction material shipped into USSD by the end of January, and then they will be you know sitting there and waiting for terrace test being done, and then we'll be starting construction in spring. Uh, I expect we will start testing likely in July. So more importantly, if you like want to do some payload testing, put something in the building, um, let us know. Uh, I got my email, and then you can always visit the project site. Next one. Uh, Clothement uh, apparently for NERI and National Science Foundation, uh, and uh, because this is a wood project, we're also being supported greatly by U.S. Forest Service and USDA, and uh, then actually who the next slide, our industry partners who actually provided uh, most of the funding and the material for the entire project. Uh, the, I believe the total donation for this project uh, has uh, uh, been about uh, more than $2 million. And it will take about uh, um, more than $3 million to do a project like this. And uh, that price has been <laughs> floated quite a bit uh, because of the COVID and uh, logistic chain issues. But anyway, we, we're gonna, we have gained enough momentum, we're gonna proceed and finish it. Okay, that's all about this project. And uh, then um, we're gonna have Andre talk about it. Then you're like, okay, well, that's the end of the project, right? Uh, well, uh, I'll let Andre tell you about it. It's always hard to follow such a great act uh, by Ling, but I'll Ling and Carrie in this case. But uh, I'll do, <laughs> I'll do my best here. Um, so um, we we've been working, um, you know, a group of us. I'll, I'll show you shortly. A group of us have been working with Ling and that uh, the NSF Tallwood team since 2017. I believe the first conversation was actually at the World Conference, uh, Earthquake Engineering where Joel uh, mentioned, uh, what if you guys tested a two-story structure or something yeah. on the shake table in 2017? And that's yeah. how this uh, partnership started. So it's, it's been great. And we've been collaborating and you know, helping the 10th the story as much as we could. Um, and then um, as part of what Ling was just mentioning of leveraging more funds, but also answering additional research questions, there's such a great opportunity with uh, a unique um, test like this. So we started thinking about opportunities and, and this was one, one that spurred and we submitted 
um, a proposal which is called Converging Design Methodology. We are looking at multi-objective optimization of resilient structural spines. And I'll, I'll summarize that proposal and how it builds on the, the 10th story. So um, this, this partnership uh, started, as I was mentioning, 2017. And so the two-story project here on the left, um, let me use the pen. So um, here on the left, uh, Link showed some, some results and videos of that. Um, we were, were fortunate uh, at, at OSU to um, be able to secure some funding from USDA ARS. And this is a project where we're looking um, in a new lab, the lab that we've built here um, at OSU at Oregon State University. Uh, we're looking at different and innovative mass timber lateral resisting systems. We created um, a three-story structure that is also reusable, very much like Tara and Chris Pantelidis uh, mentioned earlier today. Um, and we're assessing different lateral resisting systems. It's uniaxial test. Then there's the 10 story. Um, this is not the, the latest and most beautiful drawings and videos that Link showed, um, and not even the shake table. Uh, I need to update this because we don't have the biaxial uh, nature of the, the shaking right there. Uh, but this was part of what we included in the proposal. What we're doing in, in this project is we're going to, as part of demolishing the structure, we will demolish the top four stories um, be left with a six story structure and we will test first by swapping out some of the energy dissipation devices um, and swapping out those and testing a structural system. And then to demonstrate that these buildings are repairable and you can come in with a, a different lateral resisting system, we will have a second uh, series of tests where we will swap out two of the out, out walls. So um, very challenging as you can already be imagining it would not be possible if we weren't talking with Ling and his team from the beginning, from inception of the design um, to even make this possible. There's a lot of nuances in the design that will allow this to, to be possible. Of course, it's still a challenge, but even the demolition will be a challenge. It's, it's such a unique um, project. Um, okay, now how do I move this forward? So in our NSF proposal, our overarching aim is, is trying to look and, and address um, what uh, went into the US Congress recently in 2020 and the report of 2021, looking at the 2018 congressional reauthorization of the NEHRP program. And so that report really defined performance goals in terms of post earthquake reoccupancy and recovery time and functionality. And so along with that, we um, our overarching aim is to integrate functionality-based design, and in our case, also multi-objective optimization into a converging, as we've labeled it, converging design methodology to support resilient, sustainable seismic designs using innovative lateral force resisting systems. So um, our converging design methodology is here in the middle. It does leverage um, multi-objective optimization, functionality-based design, and integrates those to support resilient sustainability and innovation. Um, our three main uh, intellectual merit um, identified were that we will define, um, and we, you'll see shortly, it's a big team and project advisory committee. It's not something that you can build consensus just with a project team, uh, just like Ling was showing, it leverages a lot of our industry partners as well, but define functional recovery and sustainability metrics and create and implement a multi-objective optimization in a converging seismic design methodology and develop these optimized um, seismic lateral force resisting systems, which will be validated by a six story test. Um, our work plan includes five main tasks. Uh, task one, which is methodology and metrics of converging design is um, where we'll work with our project advisory team and we'll have a series of workshops where we elicit expert, um, expert feedback on what should be included and what archetypes, what building types should we be addressing with the solutions. We will prototype some of the solutions and I'll, I'll focus a little bit on this presentation on this prototype testing on this task 2.3. And then uh, there's the methodology, the optimization um, implementation, methodology validation, that includes the shake table test. I'll also mention that a little bit and natural dissemination. Um, our partners, uh, well, the project, the PIs, um, are myself, Dr. Barb Simpson, Arjit Singh at OSU, Dr. Nathan Brown um, at Penn State, and uh, John Vandalent at um, Colorado State. 
we have a, a big team. Um, these four um, are students that are working uh, directly on the project. We have two funded students. One currently has a graduate fellowship. Um, and the second one is actually a Fulbright scholar this year. And then CSU and PSU are now hiring uh, students for this. But because this is such you know, collaborative work and we are leveraging other projects as well, we have Carly to Fernando and Gustavo as well. Um, all of the work that we'll be doing would not be possible without them. Um, we have project collaborators. Uh, the main principal one is right here up front. Um, Ling, uh, it all, none of this would be possible without him. And then we have industry collaborators, both engineers and also architects. Uh, so we, we did look carefully to making sure that everything that we were developing was useful and would have as much impact as possible. And then project advisory committee, where we have a group that works mainly in construction and design. Um, so Swinerton, Lever, and SOM. We have also code and regulatory, both city of Portland, Forest Products Lab and NIST, uh, especially uh, Siamak Satar was the one that was leading the effort um, that went into the report um, that went into Congress. And then we have the wood, steel, and concrete industry partners, um, both uh, manufacturers, Woodworks, Simpson Strong Tie, and also the Pankow Foundation. So we, we, we believe that for most of these applications, and even when using mass timber, um, there's going to be parts of the structure that are ideal. And like we do with steel and concrete, we use multiple um, structural systems. We use multiple materials in buildings. We believe that in a future design, we'll be integrating multiple materials as well. And then we have uh, our international outreach collaboration, Canada, Japan, uh, New Zealand, and Europe uh, through Italy. So to focus a little bit on work we have been doing, um, this is task 2.3. Uh, we're going to explore the use of our new lab, um, which is actually a mass timber building, um, except our, uh, our, our reaction wall, which is reinforced concrete, and the strong floor, which is also reinforced concrete, but the rest is um, all mass timber. We have uh, finished last month. Um, the, we constructed a three-story building, uh, full scale, where we have two lateral resisting systems already there. We'll test one at a time, um, and the test will be... Uh, in one direction, but it's really to test different innovative lateral resisting systems. So uh, phase one um, here on the, you can see a 3D view of the building. Uh, there's a lot of acronyms uh, here. MPP is a type of uh, engineered wood product called mass plywood panel. Um, it is uh, from, from Oregon, developed in Oregon. UFP is U flexural plates. So that's actually the steel energy dissipators. And so this wall, which has mass timber, it's a MPP wall, mass plywood pattern wall as well, uh, but has a steel um, U, U flexural plates that provide energy dissipation and the wall is post-tensioned. Um, and then the testing is mainly in the north-south direction. Um, and so we are testing this wall and then a, a second wall system. The mass timber still, the gravity system um, are LVL, laminated veneer lumber, beams and columns, and foundation beams, we use both steel. And for the experimental setup, we also use some timber wall, timber uh, beams as well. So that's the direction of testing. Um, uh, just another view of the building. Um, phase two, um, we take out the wall one, uh, which is phase one, and then we test uh, phase two. And phase two is what I'll, I'll give a little bit more detail about. Um, it does use, again, mass plywood panel walls, but we are using BRB, buckling restrained braces, as energy dissipators. Instead of the U flexural plates, we're using buckling restrained braces. And so um, let me show you just the, the design. What becomes critical in these systems is the connection of things like uh, buckling restrained brace. We heard Chris Pantelidis talk about core brace. This is the smallest um, buckling restrained brace that core brace can fabricate. And they're uh, providing uh, that one as well. And then what is interesting and, and always uh, an interesting challenge and each project um, does have their, their unique things is the design of the connections. Um, so design of the connection in this case between the BRB and uh, a mass plywood panel um, to create our lateral resisting system and then between the walls and the floors um, as well. So a zoom, zoomed in view here of the, the, the wall that we have just finished uh, building. There's the BRB, 
Um, you don't really see the connections here because they're behind um, the LVL beam. So this would be the view that somebody would have if they were inside the building. In this particular case, it's a rocking um, pivoting wall. Um, so uh, compressions and tension forces are taken by the BRBs and then uh, the shear, shear keys at the ends um, that capture the wall from moving laterally. This is a more detailed view of that connection that's hidden, the connection between the BRB and the MPP. Most of these to provide stiffness um, and to provide strength. In this case, for example, we're using inclined screws. These are pretty long uh, inclined screws and a steel um, connection, um, high-end uh, bucket connection to allow us to transfer forces with as little deformation as possible in this connection system. Um, we've been doing some modeling in open seas, very much like Chris um, Pantelides was showing. In this particular case, it's just for uh, to start understanding how these walls would perform under our Curie protocol tests in the lab. And um, we have to calibrate models of buckling restrained braces using data, in this case from, from core braces as well that they share. So we could, um, sorry, here on the right is the BRB behavior and calibrated model. And on the left is the base shear um, at the base of the building versus roof drift that we can achieve with this type of uh, system. Um, as we continue to develop further uh, modeling detailing, um, these connections and the stiffness of, of these connections are important. And so here is an example of tests that were actually provided by our industry partner um, that developed these screws. And it is, they did a series of tests that give us the stiffness of these inclined screws with um, a steel member. And with that, we can start developing models um, to account for, um, in this case, a pinching for material model that we're inputting into our open seas model as well. Um, task 4.1 within our, our big overview is where we're going to go back to the shake table test, as I had mentioned. And so um, just to summarize, and in the interest of time here, um, we are going to be testing two wall solutions. And we're working both with the 10 story team, but also in our, in our design here to test different solutions. Um, we're currently evaluating four lateral force resisting systems based on lessons learned in 2017, some industry feedback, and also uh, lessons that we're learning uh, even on fabrication and constructability of some of the things that went into the three-story. Uh, we're going to be sharing our design alternatives, and we have been in contact with our project collaborators, but we'll be sharing with our project advisory committee um, our designs, and then based on their feedback, um, work to select a design uh, by March 2022, so that we can then start working on, um, you know, what's here in dot, dot, dot from, um, as Ling can allude uh, very clearly, it takes a lot of effort to go from these designs to actually make things work on the shake table. And, and we will start working, you know, collecting um, project uh, costs and look, we have to look at multiple companies to provide us bids for these. Um, so as we start developing, the other thing is just integrating the work with the 10 story project. So um, as soon, you know, the links uh, project and links team is looking at six to nine months um, on the shake table. Um, and so we follow straight after that. So we're, we're hoping, um, you know, to be testing in early 2023, but demolition uh, work would start late 2022. Um, I'm going to build on some of the takeaways that Link mentioned um, and that we heard during the presentations today. One is specimen reuse. Um, it, it does require co-production uh, work and early on, but specimen reuse is a great opportunity. Um, here, um, not only is Link within the 10 story looking at multiple questions, research questions that are being answered using the 10 story, but we're leveraging it a little bit further as a group to be able to test these two solutions for the six story and demonstrate some of the repair solutions that can be uh, implemented as well. Co-production. So in, you hear a lot of co-production with industry and making work as impactful as possible. I would say that our co-production are also with our academic collaborators. Uh, a lot of this work would not be possible if there wasn't trust and collaboration from, from the beginning. And, and that, you know, it, it's not who takes 
the prize, but it's it's more of all of us as a community taking the prize and being able to make these projects work. Um, collaboration and trust is key. And then one of the things that we are already looking carefully into is um, you know, the demolishing of these of these panels provide another opportunity with an opportunity for reuse. Um, I, I know in San Francisco, California, in the Northwest, but many other cities, I am sure, right now have quite a bit of problems related to homeless, related to COVID, essentially, and people not being able um, to be in shelters in, in large groups of people. And so there's efforts that we're looking into with the architects um, that are on this project of trying to reuse already some of these panels um, as shelters or potential individual shelters that would be used. So it's, you know, it's, it's something that we're looking into and hopefully we can leverage so that these don't just go to landfill. However, it's a challenge. Um, there's a lot of connections. There's a lot of steel fabrication that is connected to the mass timber panels as well. So reuse opportunity is something we're um, thinking and looking into as well. Uh, with that, um, any questions or comments? Thank you very much uh, for the three uh, speakers. Very spectacular upcoming project. So I imagine that we will have a number of questions. Maybe not right away. I mean, I have some questions for the, the, the fire protection of all the, the structural components. It's just an extra thickness of wood, uh, no, no other fire protection material to be applied on 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 top um I, the the ibc the basically fire code requires they don't require a specific way you achieve a certain fire rating fire rating basically they require for like gravity system columns you have to be three hour fire rating which means the fire can burn you for three hours but you don't collapse so having extra wood uh, sacrificial layer is one way to achieve that uh, of course, you can also wrap everything with a chipboard. Like one half inch chipboard will likely provide you like half an hour, uh, um, accept and uh, accepted by the code. So, uh, but the the issue with mass timber building is uh, investors typically, if they choose to go with a mass timber option, they want to expose as much wood as they could. So they're gonna push the architect and the structural engineers to expose as much wood as you can. For the IBC 18 story, the code prohibited you to have exposed wood. So you have to achieve all your fire rating, how many hours, whatever it is, using non-combustible, which is pretty much chipboard. But uh, if you go down to 12 stories, you can expose, I mean, don't quote me on it, but like roughly like 60% of all, the, all your wood. So that becomes really interesting and became a kind of incentive thing. Uh, for the investors to go with that style. Then the sacrificial layer is the only option at this point on the market. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have another question. The, can you comment on uh, one of you on the, the glue that is used for this cross laminated timber, the, the, the behavior, you know, the long-term behavior and the strength of the glue and so on? Because I, I think it's a very critical part, part mm -hmm. of this uh, cross-laminated timber material, right? Yeah, Andre, you want to take that one? Um, sure. Uh, the the latest um, products um, are what are, that are ANSI PRG three hundred and twenty approved. Um, there are specific requirements for the adhesives in terms of performance and of the panels. So depending on how, you know the hour, what's the hour rating that you are designing for? Most of these are for two plus um, hour uh, rating. And so they have to demonstrate that uh, the panels can withstand and not lose these properties and capacity. And there's no delamination of the timber materials up to two hours and you can achieve more even. But this is without the chip uh, board and without um, mm -hmm. additional protection as Ling was mentioning. So as part of the certification of the products that has to be assessed as well. I see. Mm. What about the long-term behavior? Yeah, the not, longevity. Not fire, like twenty years, thirty years, fifty years. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, uh, apparently, CLT itself has only been 
in place for uh, about 10, 15 years. I mean, I mean, it's probably a little bit earlier in Europe, but uh, like the 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 production uh, production material and production process has been continually evolving and improving. So I would say the current uh, like uh, PRG three twenty type of uh, North American uh, codified CLT is only been in the market for around uh, ten to fifteen years. Uh, so we we don't have direct data from CLT, but uh, we do know that uh, you have. Uh, Glue lamps, which is uh, using very similar process and very similar material, and you seeing those uh, old glue lamp bridges, uh, the highway, some of the local highway, uh, yeah, they last for for a long time. And they, in fact, there are some some bridges even you know pushing to like almost hundred year. So I I, I think uh, you know the, the straight answer is that for CLT itself, I mean we we don't have a direct. Um, direct a long time. I mean, Andre, maybe you know some of the accelerated uh, durability testing? Yeah, there's some um, accelerated durability testing that are being done um, mm -hmm. in, you know, moisture and fungi um, in general, in wood is, is of concern, right? And so that's something that is being reassessed specifically for cross-laminated timber, for mass plywood panels, on top of, as Ling was mentioning, all the work that has been done in wood uh, over time. So it's not, um, you know, the degradation of wood under moisture and fungi and um, biological attack is something that is is well understood. Now we're just reassessing things for cross laminated timber and other products. Thank you very much. I would take this opportunity just as I, I do see um, Jose Restrepo is also on the call. And at least um, uh, Joel mentioned that I'm an alumni and as I was applying for jobs, uh, Jose Restrepo mentioned, why don't you look at timber? Um, this is something that's now starting. And, uh, and even in my job application interview, um, that I use that as, uh, you know, took that to heart. So as part of takeaways as well, for at least for younger, um, I still consider myself young, um, not assistant professor anymore, but still young. Uh, for younger um, members on this call, uh, do listen sometimes to your, to the elders and, and see what what messages they have to tell you. Let's see, uh, any other? Thank you, Andre. I think there is a question. Yes, there's a question in the Q&A. Yeah. Are the non-structural interior walls which can accommodate large lateral displacement available in the market yet or waiting to be verified through this research? Well, the, as I mentioned, I mean, I think um, like non-structural walls, interior walls, um, it's a design detail. So they can be detailed however people choose to. And um, the, the slip tracks are available or being, being used. As far as, far as I know, um, there's very little attention to, there has been very little attention to measures to accommodate the um, corner drifts at the intersection. And those really have not been implemented. And what we're doing in this project that's that's different is using these commercial expansion joints for that practice, uh, for that purpose. And those are available. So it's it's more of a design question if, you know, when, when someone would wanna go to that, um, put that attention into the design of the interior systems and incorporate the different solutions that are, are available. I think it, it can be done. I think like much is, is yet to be verified. We haven't seen a, a perfect test that shows, demonstrates one of these solutions working perfectly yet. Um, one thing that we have encountered as you know, a result of this, of this project is, with interior walls in particular, it does get very complicated depending on the layout of the walls to try to incorporate the solutions. And, and maybe it was more complex in this case because of the geometry and layout of the test specimen. We're working around beams, we're working around just a whole lot of constraints that you may not have in the real world, but it, it does get 
complicated. And, you know, at the outset of this project, I was really gung-ho to try to solve this problem. And as a result of, of um, working on it, I've, I've sort of become a little bit more questioning, like, hmm, I wonder if this really is worth it for interior walls because of the, the complexity. Um, but still anxious to see how Mm -hmm. what we're doing in the test is going to work. And, and in particular, I'm anxious to see um, for the, the exterior walls. Now, I'd say that, you know, the, the solutions that we're testing here for the exterior skins are going to work best on a square building <laughs> with four corners where you don't have a lot of complex ge geometry to work with. As soon as you start including all these angles and everything around the outside, you have to accommodate that that drift at the intersection and, and it's complicated. So even there, there could be some practical considerations that are gonna make it more difficult. So and all interesting to think about. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, any, any comment about the, what you expect in the, if there is some strong torsional behavior in the response combined with the rocking of the wall? Mm, yeah, well, specific I, design, design specific, uh, designed, you know, uh, details to accommodate this or? Oh, uh, I'll let Kerry comment on the. You're the gonna, I think it's, to the, I think it's to pertain, pertains to the entire structure, not just non-structural. Yeah, uh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, talking recent, about that. Yeah, our most recent assessment of, um, of the mass distribution and the stiffness distribution throughout the structure suggests there's going to be significant um, torsion, significant asymmetries. And the team is kind of still looking at that and wondering if there's anything that we can do to address it. Our original plan had, um, had the addition of added mass and at some point we decided that the non-structural components and everything that we're adding um, was sufficient that we didn't really need to add mass. But I think now we're still kind of questioning as we assess the, the torsion, whether it might be good to add a little mass anyway to try to alleviate some of those issues. Um, but I, we are not going to have a perfectly symmetric structure. I'm pretty, much, I'm pretty sure we can say that. And there will, yeah. um, we're expected yeah. to see some of that in the test. How, how about, uh, let's say the wall, one wall is rocking, right? And, and then now you have torsion and it comes back in a different position as it, it was initially. That, 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 that is, uh, I don't think that's, that, I don't think that's possible because the, the wall, the, the toe of the wall. Oh yeah, you see it's actually in a, in a trench. Uh, on, a, on, a, on a trench, so I on a build-up right. trench. Yeah. So, so the uh, I would say the the torsion it will be notable, but uh, it's uh, I think uh, we we run our simu simulation with uh, the uh, original plan assessment mass with minimal torsion, and then we made our design. Then we run it with the real distribution. We run it, the the torsion is more, but uh, I believe with what Jeff uh, has confirmed that uh, we're not uh, touching the design limit yet. So. I think uh, overall the torsion with with I believe Sarah said that is within five percent accidental. Um, like if you look at the eccentricity, um, but uh, yeah, the torsion is more than what we expected. But I think we can handle it. Another option is to we can start small when we start to do testing, and then if it becomes uh, an issue, we can add uh, the assessment mass plate on the top of the building to try to fight that. So yeah, that, that kind of speaks to another good, uh, <laughs> good lesson for seismic testing, large scale shake table testing is that you have to start small. You don't, you don't come on and try to do MC your first try. You do, you do a lot of system identification, then you start with uh, some frequent earthquake, go to DBE around a few of those, then you start feel comfortable. Because a lot of people always ask me, oh, have you checked the motion? Have you selected it? I mean, we, we selected a pool of motion to choose from, but a lot of the decisions are actually need to be made after we see some of the initial test results. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank Lynn. you. And we have a question, right, Rush? Yes, uh, there's a question that came in. Uh, 
in terms of the interaction between the NCS and the structural system, is this explicitly modeled, i.e. the additional energy dissipation of the panel walls? The answer is no, not up front. Um, it is a, a, it's, it is a plan for, for the project to incorporate that at the back end and try to um, you know, validate, uh, use the experiment to validate that modeling, but it has not been developed up front. As I have to say, like so much of the effort up front has, at least on our part, has gone into the, the design of the, the non-structural walls. And, and you know, students have done all the design and, and detailing and AutoCAD drawings and so on. It's taken up the majority of, of the, the last year of planning. So long-term plan, but, but not yet. And I think it's, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, we all know, I think that's a good question because we all know for light frame wood walls, the non-structural components actually contribute uh, up to 40% you know, of stiffness and sometimes strength. They're not so ductile, but they do contribute. Uh, I think at least this test will help answer, like to look at uh, how, how, how good our model is without considering that to help to answer for those new mass timber buildings, how much contribution those non-structural yeah. systems will, will give. I might make another comment about this. Actually, I had a PhD student that just finished and did some of the component testing of the slip track walls at, at Lehigh. And he did some, um, some modeling of uh, not structure, non-structural interaction and used different um, detailing assumptions for the non-structural mm -hmm. walls. I mentioned the full connection where they're fully connected versus slip track. Yeah. And the conclusions were, and it kind of makes sense, if you have a fully connected system, it's going to contribute a lot more strength and, and uh, stiffness and overall um, resistance versus the slip track. If they really slip without a lot of resistance. They don't contribute much and they don't influence the response of the structure other than the added, added mass, you know, count for the mass, but yeah. So that it, it all depends on how well these systems work. If they work well, they're not expected to interact with the structure substantially. But I know we will we'll see. <laughs> we will see a lot. Uh, I'm sure. Well, I think it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna I be want helpful. Be pessimistic, but yeah, it's, gonna, it's gonna dissipate more energy. It's gonna be helpful. I think we're on the conservative <laughs> side for for not considering. There, there you go. Yeah. I think I saw a hand up. Was that Jose? Hi, Andrea. No, I just, just wanted to say hi to all of you. It's a very exciting uh, project indeed. Uh, with regard to torsion, in my opinion, uh, for all of you, it's, it's the loss of strength, which is perhaps more important. I wouldn't fear having a torsional response. And remember, in the four-story building, we really intended to have torsion, and we had wild torsion. Uh, we had interstory drifts that approach uh, eight percent or so at some corners or so. Um, so no fear, but is the loss of strength which you may, particularly with the uh, partitions, see the partitions are contributing not only significantly to the stiffness but to the strength initially, and they drop. That's where you may. That's probably where you want to. Um, concentrate a little bit your ideas. But by the time MCER arrives, your partition may be highly degraded or so. I don't know, but it could be. That's my experience, I think. That, that, that's, a, that's a very great point. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jose. I think, yeah, yeah you say torsion itself is not a big issue. Every building will have some torsion, but as long as they don't like damage your lateral system to a point that you have, uh, severe you know lacking in one one of the walls but in this case i, I think it's uh for, for, for this building it's it's okay because uh um if you guys still remember for the two story we, we tried so hard to try to yield the pt bars uh, but now if you think about now our pt bars is even longer to to the, the yielding string of that pt bar will be about like half a feet and there's no way our wall going to be rocked to that far so it's I I I'm I'm very confident that uh, the the uh, the torsion yeah you know, it might uh, make our model a little bit uh, less accurate, but I don't think uh, we will have a, a degrading strength uh, 
issue for those four walls. Um, yeah, simply because yeah. The, the the bars are too long to to yield. <laughs> are you planning shilling to um, have a blind prediction? Uh, yeah, fr frankly, we're 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 thinking about it. About what now? We're we're really like. We haven't we haven't uh, selected our ground motion pool yet. So yeah, to do a blind prediction, yeah, we, we, you have to get a full set, everything finalized, and to send people what you're gonna do test down. We, we haven't made that decision yet. Uh, if time allows, we'll do it. But we, we'll see how how it goes. Uh, so basically, right now, myself is uh, kind of a buried with logistics and construction, and and uh, my uh, co PI Jeff Berman, he's uh, buried with this torsional new thing he has to rerun his thing and then try to select ground motion and then instrumentation on everything so we we'll, we i think we will we'll do it uh, if we have time um, but uh, we'll see excellent work yeah very good for this team also. Yes, thank you mm -hmm. very good so i guess on the interest of time we should uh, continue but if you have more question uh, we'll have uh, more time at the end so again, thank you very much, the three uh, presenters. So now we will have uh, Dr. Gianluca Cusatis, who is program director at the National Science Foundation and also a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Northwestern University. He, he's an expert in uh, engineering mechanics, fracture and concrete. Thank you, Joe. Um, you let me see if I yeah we can hear you we can see your uh do you see the main or the do you see the correct uh, screen or the presenter view i think we see the correct one okay very good so i'll uh, i'll think i'll have this brief about 10 15 minutes because i i prefer to have more interaction and uh, answer questions as they may come um so first of all i have an, an introduction well let me talk about myself first as, as you said i'm Gianluca Cusatis. i'm a faculty member at northwest university and i'm a rotator uh, program director at nsf i i joined nsf um, end of august so it's been just a little over um, three months and well, almost four months. Um, so uh, this is uh, NSF by the numbers. Uh, this is for uh, the budget on um, uh, the fiscal year 2020. And as you can see, NSF had about $0.5 billion in budget. Uh, which really 94%, so almost the entirety of the budget goes uh, to fund research, uh, education, major research equipment and facilities. So it's really money that goes uh, for research. We evaluated about 43,000 proposals and um, they, they were funded about 12,000. 12, so you can, um, you know, in terms of number of proposals, uh, we know it's one in four uh, uh, about, and uh, these include you know more than three hundred thousand people funded on NSF money, um, almost two thousand funded institutions, um, and and many of the our PIs are, are really well recognized. Uh, almost two hundred fifty were um, uh, awarded Nobel Prize, um, so. The, the organization of, of NSF uh, okay, it's here, is, um, yeah, it's here. So we have a director uh, and that uh, is helped by a national science board and different offices, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, General Council, International Integrative Activities, and the Office of Legislative and Public Affairs. And then um, the director, um, uh, the, the, the organization is based on uh, different directorates that you see here in those boxes. Um, the work that we all do in our community is the, within the engineering directorate, of course. 
And uh, the current director of the engineering directorate is Susan Margulis. Um, and the, she leads the work of the directorate that is organi organized with, in different di divisions that you can see in the block at the bottom. There are the three center divisions, the uh, CBAT, CMMI, and ECCS, which are the actual you know, research um, uh, divisions. And then there are two additional divisions, the uh, engineering education and centers that deal, as the name say, on education activities and centers activity, and the newly formed industrial innovation and partnerships, or IIP uh, division that is a, a new division that takes care of uh, translating the basic research that you all do into uh, practice in practice. And so it, it's sort of uh, the um, programs that uh, make sure that the basic research eventually goes into um, benefiting society. CMMI, uh, Civil Mechanical and Manufacturing Innovation uh, Division, is the one within um, the, the, uh, the work that we are talking at this workshop and all the work that you guys are doing. The director is Robert Stone. Um, and there are four, five different clusters in, in CMMI, Advanced Manufacturing, Dynamics Control and Combination, Operation and Design, Mechanics and Engineering Materials, and uh, the Resilient Sustainable Infrastructures Cluster, which is the cluster where I, um, I, uh, I work on. And that cluster has two programs, the ECI program, Engineering for Civil Infrastructure program, and the National Hazard Engineering Research Infrastructure program. The NERI program, as you probably all know, is at this point only an infrastructure program, so it funds uh, infrastructure. Uh, but the actual research on natural hazard is funded through the ECI program. <clears throat> uh, there are two program direct, three program directors, sorry, uh, on, on the RSI cluster. Myself, that I'm a rotator, uh, Giovanna Biscontin, who is a permanent, and of course, Joy Posky, that is a permanent program director as well. Um, Giovanna is the uh, program director that deals with uh, geomechanics, geotechnical engineering, and, um, and, and coastal engineering. Uh, Joy uh, handles all the proposals that are relevant to hazards, uh, natural hazards, and of course, all the NERI proposals. And the proposals I handle are the one that deal with infrastructure materials, um, and structural engineering, if they are known known hazards proposals, or even sometimes if there are hazards, but the main concepts are not in the natural hazards aspect, but in the structural engineering aspects. Um, we support fundamental research in infrastructure materials and architecture, geotechnical and structural engineering uh, that we hope will shape uh, the future of the national civil infrastructure. So civil infrastructure is really at the center of what we are interested in. Uh, we focus on geomaterial and geostructures, infrastructure materials. Infrastructure materials is pretty much any material that you might use in, 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 a, in a civil infrastructure. So of course includes concrete, semi vitreous composites, steel, wood, um, mass timber, of course, um, composites and, and, and really any other innovative materials that uh, we are seeing to, um, to, to make an impact in, 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 in civil infrastructure. We do fund both structural and non-structural research on structural and non-structural systems. And that includes, of course, building envelopes. We are interested in uh, both the behavior of civil infrastructure to extreme events, uh, but also to the behavior of civil infrastructure under normal service condition, and in particular, of course, long-term effects, durability, aging, deterioration, and the combination of, of, of those things uh, in one single um, uh, you know, framework. We, we are very much interested in looking at uh, civil infrastructure throughout the entire lifetime of the structure, um, and, and so that requires many times a lot of um, 
uh, intersection of different disciplines uh, to make research uh, significant. So these are some of the topics that we are uh, interested in at the moment. You know, keep in mind that those things change. We are right now in the, as I mentioned, I joined NSF uh, about four, four, four months ago, and we are right now in the, in the process of uh, <clears throat> looking at our program and deciding what we want to um, focus on, on, on in the future, in the next three, four, five years. But at the moment, these are some topic priority areas for ECI. Um, so ob obviously um, some of, of those topics are quite um, not traditional, but you know, people have been working a lot on predictive modeling simulation, but there are still many things to do. Um, many people have worked on uncertain risk and reliability engineering, but we still do fund those type of research. Um, uh, multifunctionality, as far as far as materials are concerned, is of interest. Uh, Biomimetics and bioinspiration is something that many PIs have had success in uh, um, getting funding and doing uh, outstanding research. So we will keep uh, that uh, topic in, in our priority areas. Uh, data science and, of course, artificial intelligence and machine learning are. Um, aspect that um, many fields of engineering are interested in, and so um, uh, are we. Um, the, the few points were specifically on artificial intelligence and machine learning proposals that I want to mention, because as I said, this is one very popular topic, so we do get a lot of proposals that either are focusing specifically on AI or they have components of AI. And it is important that uh, PIs um, address some of these issues, which typically uh, are um, reason why those proposals don't get funded. And so first of all, you know, really PIs should, uh, proposals should address what is the fundamental knowledge uh, advancement that we made with specific relevance to civil infrastructure, because again, the, the ECI program is about civil infrastructure. Um, it's important to that uh, proposals clarify whether the intellectual merit of those uh, artificial intelligence methods are in the method themselves, the methods themselves, or in their application to you know a civil engineering problem. Right? At the, at the center of all these methods, uh, there are there is data. So it is uh, crucial that proposals identify what are the data sets that will be used in the research. And, which is particularly complicated in civil engineering, uh, whether the data set is large enough for the selected AI method approach that is proposed. You know, those AI methods quite often, they do marvelous things, but they require very large uh, sets of data actually they shine really on very large sets of data. And so the, if a proposal proposes to use a certain uh, AI method without discussing the size of the data set, uh, that is certainly something that uh, will be flagged and would be reason not to consider those proposals. Also, if you, if you do need a large data set and you cannot really um, uh, convince the reviewers and us that you can collect the data during uh, the duration of the, pro the project, well, that is going to be a problem as well, right? So either you have the data already or if you need to collect, it needs to be feasible. Uh, it needs to be a feasible task within the project. Um, the, the other aspect that is important proposal focusing on AI and machine learning uh, approaches uh, address is if, do we really need AI, right? So it doesn't have to be uh, something that we use if we don't need it. You know, sometimes it seems that uh, all proposals now must have AI components, and that is not the case for us at least. No, that is not the case for ECI. Uh, actually quite the opposite in the sense that you really need to convince ourselves that there are no other methods uh, that uh, are out there 
which uh, are not better or, or, or equivalent to the AI method that you are proposing. The last but not least, really, we are civil engineers and um, we need to convince the reviewers and, and the program directors that uh, if uh, we propose something that is on data science, well, we have that expertise, right? And so if you don't, then it's uh, uh, recommended that you find collaborations uh, with people that do have that expertise if you want to uh, provide, um, I mean, if you want to include these type of topics in your proposal, all right? Now, these are research topics that we do not support in ECI. And again, um, this is as, as at today, no? in a month, in two months, these things might change because uh, uh, of changes that periodically we put, uh, we make uh, to, the, to the program. Research that lacks grounding theory, uh, research that is not fundamental. So if you have uh, something, if, you, if a proposal uh, is submitted to NSF uh, really needs to be a fundamental research, otherwise it will not be considered. Um, research that is not fo focused on civil infrastructure. Again, civil infrastructure is at the core of our program, is at the core of all the, 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 the research we fund uh, within ECI. We don't fund or we tend not to fund research that is a responsibility of other agencies, so this includes uh, nuclear power plants, uh, that's of course for NRC to fund, energy related infrastructure that is more DOE type of funding, or transportation infrastructures um, and, and bridges, roadway payments, waterways. Uh, although sometimes we might fund some of those things if there is a fundamental aspect that for whatever reason, those uh, mission agency, uh, agency do not consider. A hazard catalyzation for a mitigation of, of impact of explosion, fire, and blast loading. We don't fund that. We, don't, we do fund uh, structural monitoring, of course, but not development of sensor technologies. So you, if you have a sensor, you deploy them, you work on data, that's absolutely fair game. Uh, the actual development of sensor is not. Um, and also, we don't do uh, natural hazard characterization, which is more for geoscience director. All right. Uh, this is uh, the a slide on the NERI facilities. I think many of you are quite familiar with those facilities. Of course, all well, this workshop is uh, centered on the large uh, shake table at UC San Diego and the updating that is currently uh, being uh, completed. And uh, the NERI facilities, the NERI system includes uh, geotechnical centrifuges at UC Davis, uh, mobile field shakers at the University of Texas, Austin, uh, wave basins and flumes at the Oregon State University, uh, the National Hazard Reconnaissance Equipment like drones and this type of things at the University of Washington. Um, the University of Colorado Boulder, NERI has the extreme event reconnaissance coordination. A, everything is coordinating through Purdue University and through the NCO, Network Coordination Office. UC Berkeley uh, leads the work on computation and simulation through the Sim Center. Um, the community cyber infrastructure is at the University of Texas, Austin. And then uh, there are two wind simulation facilities, one at Florida International University and the other one at University of Florida. And then uh, the hybrid simulation facility is hosted at Lehigh University. And this is a unique set of facilities that NSF has funded over the year and we continue to fund in the future, uh, which really makes uh, uh, the, the uh, um, allows research natural hazard natural hazard community to a vast array of um, different opportunities for their research okay i think i will uh i think i went already uh long i i just briefly want to discuss um nsf merit review criteria more for uh, the younger uh, researchers assistant professors students and postdocs that are connected to this call the, we, we review proposals based on two ma main criteria, the intellectual merit and the broader impact. 
uh, the, the intellectual merit and the broader impact are typically evaluated based on these five different points. So the potential for the proposal activity to advance knowledge and benefit society, uh, the extent uh, to, to which the proposed activity suggests and explore create creative original potential transformative concepts. Then we look at the research plan, make sure that is well reasoned, well organized. Uh, we look at the qualification of the team. So when I mentioned earlier about AI and the fact that uh, PIs that propose uh, AI approaches needs to be qualified as part of the intellectual merit. And part of the intellectual merit is also to evaluate whether uh, the PIs have enough resources at their own institution or through collaboration to, to carry, carry out the proposed activities. For, um, for the broader impact, uh, there are uh, different ways to accomplish broader impact. The one, ask, one way is through the research itself. You know, if you, if you do a research and then that the research that, uh, is later translated into practice, then of course uh, is a broader impact. But broader impact can also achieved through activities that are directly related to the specific research projects. I mean, uh, this includes a number of activities in which you can do outreach or, or, or new courses or new educational um, uh, provide new education opportunities for specific uh, students' populations. Um, but also, event, you can also achieve a broader impact through activities that are supported by, but are complementary to the project. So they're not necessarily aligned with the research they're doing in the project, but as um, parallel activities that you uh, perform during the duration of the project. Now, one recommendation is uh, that, um, that we always uh, uh, ask the PI to consider where the right proposal is, don't take the broader impact as a, a tick list, right? Don't have to have everything, right? From K-12 to graduate education and outreach and, um, and everything that we see uh, done, which are all very uh, meaningful activities. You just need to pick the activities that make more sense for you. Uh, and this is a list of potential examples of some of those activities and do a good job in proposing a plan to conduct those activities. Also a, an aspect that is quite often overlooked uh, uh, as far as broader impact is concerned is the assessment of the success of those results. Now for the broader impact is somewhat easier because you will need to uh, produce peer reviewed papers, right? The faculty members at universities, that's what uh, your job is, right? And so the production of peer review papers, that is a, a, a direct evaluation of the intellectual merit of a research. But we don't, there is not an equivalent mechanism to evaluate the broader impact of, of your research. Hence, including in your activity assessment of the educational outreach activity is something that we more and more are interested in seeing in our proposal, in the, in the proposals we found. And with this, I'll, I'll thank you for the opportunity to talk to this group. Uh, this is the new you know, NSF building. Many of you have been there. I've been there as a, as a reviewer of proposals, but not as a program director yet, since uh, um, I've been uh, doing my job remotely. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll go back there or I'll go there uh, for the first time in January. And thank you again. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any question you guys might have. Thank you very much, uh, Gianluca. Thank you for your very informative presentation. Thank you very much. So do we have any question uh, for NSF? Yes, uh, there is a question uh, that's come through in the uh, Q&A. Uh, do you have any advice for young researchers applying for NSF fundings? Uh, what guidelines should we look at? It's a very general, general question. Uh, well, I guess uh, the, 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 first, the first suggestion I have is have great ideas. 
I mean, that's the, the, the that's the first the, the first thing. Uh, then talk to us. I think I, I do suggest to talk to us. We are, you know, th three program directors, as I mentioned, and we are very happy to talk to, to individual PIs. So if you have an idea, uh, typically the way to go is to write a draft of your summary, right, with the, 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 the introduction, the intellectual merit section, the broader impact section. And so one page, you send it to me, you know, you send to Joy, you send to Giovanna, depending on what is your specific field, or you send it to all three of us, and then we decide who can handle it. And uh, and so, and then we can schedule a call, you know, now that we learned that we don't have to meet to actually have a meaningful conversation, we have the technology to do that. Uh, you just organize, we organize a, a, a Zoom call and uh, we spend half an hour together to, to, to discuss your idea and uh, to discuss uh, or provide, you know, the feedback uh, that you might need on, on your idea. So we are quite open and very happy to do that. We'll do that every week. Every week I meet uh, with a bunch of different PIs, young and uh, not young uh, junior and senior PIs, and uh, we, we, I discuss with them ideas. I provide them with my suggestions uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, directions of where the ECI program is going. Thank you very, very much. Um, while- uh, uh, There is a comment from Giovanna Biscontino, who is actually, I didn't know if she was in the call, she's the other program director. Uh, the, the, the other suggestion is to, of course, introduce yourself to us, send us your CV, and uh, we will uh, also make sure to invite you for, for reviewing proposals, so, which is a, you know, a very important experience, especially for, uh, for, for junior faculty participating in, panel, uh, in panels and, uh, or, or as a talk reviewers for, for proposals. Gianluca, can you comment on uh, payload uh, payload project uh, proposal? You know, uh, how different are, are they from uh, the regular proposal? Uh, are they reviewed in a different way? And and what are the emphasis to to have on this uh, payload proposal? Yeah, well, th these are proposals that uh, Joy. It typically handles, uh, I, I, I'm not 100% um, um, familiar with those proposals. I don't handle them. I don't know if Giovanna has uh, additional insight. I don't think as far as I know that they are handled differently than um, regular proposals. It's just that, you know, um, Joy is the one that uh, typically handle those. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah. Maybe I can read. I think she had sent in an email that she sent earlier, and she said uh, that during the workshop, we should highlight that NSF will support payload, also called piggyback project. And uh, the payload project should be prepared as regular NSF proposal and will undergo merit review they should be submitted nine to 12 months before planning to test. PIs should discuss ideas with the, with the program director before submission, along the line of what you were saying. Yeah, thank you, Joel. No, uh, of course, the, the, we welcome, and again, uh, Joel is the one that handled those, but in general, in the, in, within ECI, we welcome all proposal, research proposal that use the native facilities, all the facilities. Um, and, and, and there is opportunity for all type, for all researchers and all research that we fund in material structures and, and, and in geotechnical engineering to make use of, of the native facilities. And that is of course, uh, very much welcome. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions. Please, the uh, please don't be shy. <laughs> questions to NSF are very important. 
And as I said, you know, don't really, you know, don't hesitate to send us emails. Uh, we, you know, it might take a few days, but we do read the emails. We do reply to all emails we receive. Um, and, and again, um, all of us are very welcome meeting with uh, PIs to discuss ideas. Okay, so no more questions. So again, thank you very much, Gianluca. No problem. For your presentation and participation. Thank so, you, thank you. So now we are going to move to the, the next presentation by Dr. Elena Kalinina and uh, Nick, uh, Ms. Nick Klimishin. I'm going to make a very short presentation of them since they usually are not uh, in our workshops. So Dr. Elena Kalinina is a principal technical staff member in the spent nuclear fuel storage, transportation, safety, and security at, at Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque in New Mexico. She has extensive experience in modeling complex system and specializes in multidisciplinary simulation problems. Her most current work includes analysis of the shock and vibration during normal conditions of transport of spent nuclear fuel. Uh, 30 centimeter drop test, transportation risk analysis, and preparing for the seismic shake table test of a full scale dry storage system that, that they will present uh, now. And, uh, and uh, she will be co sharing the presentation with Mr. Nick Klimishin, who is a mechanical engineer in the computational structural mechanics team of the experimental and computational engineering group at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. He's a, his technical expertise is in structural mechanics and finite element analysis, uh, which he uses to support the US Department of Energy and US Nuclear Regulatory Commission in their work related to nuclear power industry, spent nuclear fuel storage and transportation and energy efficient vehicle technologies. So uh, welcome to our workshop Elena and Nick and I think Elena will start or am I right yes Elena do you need me to run your slides hello can you hear me yes uh, all right oh well yeah I have a problem with this zoom because it's not allowed by uh, you know our Sandy labs to use it so it's a web based and it's um, that's why it may not be great can you see me or no i'll try to do camera but i'm not sure can you see me uh, i think we cannot see you but we can see your slide let me see okay that's good enough that's yeah good we enough. cannot see okay. uh, your, your we cannot see your camera i guess yep okay i will try to fix it but i don't want to uh, hold on to this presentation so I, I will start with the presentation and we'll see if I can. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. If I, uh, yes, yeah, okay. So I'm just trying to do it through uh, phone and not phone. So, yes, this is presentation about our plan, plan to conduct a shake table test of full scale dry storage system of spent nuclear fuel. And we just had a chance to visit uh, LH Post facility on November 30th. And that's, I, I put a picture over there. So, because it's uh, our first visit. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Uh, is it on, I don't see a next slide here. It looks like I moved it on my screen. Does yeah, we, we can see it. Uh... Okay. Oh, okay. I. I cannot see it, but um, oh, okay, I don't have to open. I just, I don't know what's going on. Let me open my own version of it. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, we are on the page seismic shake table test roadmap. Okay, so let me just open mine because I don't see it and I will go from there. Just a second. Yeah, I'm trying to open it, sorry. So, yeah, I guess I, I can do it by heart when it's opening. So, um, 
this is uh, i would like to start my presentation with the roadmap just to show what is involved in conducting shake table test and i uh, will talk about all there elements is, on this map oh sorry it's, there is some echo i i think you there are two microphone i'll try to mute it maybe mute one of them i did uh let let's see oh, sorry. you can also leave computer audio on one of your machines if you go to the mute button and you pull up a few options you can leave computer audio if that helps Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, okay, so. Uh, so this, this roadmap show, no, that's still, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, Hello, is it better? Is yes. It better? Yes. Yeah, and now, I heard, did I get rid of echo now? No? Hello? Yes, yes, it sounds good now. It sounds good. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Okay, so I'm not on the phone anymore. Sorry. So this is a shake table test roadmap. And again, I my plan is to talk briefly about each element of modeling because the test modeling will be covered by Nick Clinician in next presentation. So next few graph, please. Okay, so this is supposed to be number three, right? We graph number three. And uh, the most important task of our um, planning for seismic, uh, seismic shake table test is developing uh, shake table inputs, uh, which are supposed to be representative of seismic and site conditions in Central Eastern and Western United States. And when I say site condition, I mean power, power plant sites and um, all of power plant sites except three at the present time have a dry storage, on site dry storage of spent nuclear fuel. And the condition at sites are very, very different. So there are 24 sites in central eastern US, which we can classify as a hard rock sites. Those sites, at those sites, we can assume that shake table motion will be the same uh, as a free field ground motion. But there are also 16 soil sites and 11 soft rock soils at which shake table motion will be different from free field ground motion due to soil structure interaction and um, flexibility, path flexibility. So what you see on the map is uh, by different colors shown different type of sites. Soil are green, soft rock are blue, and hard rock are uh, red ones. You also see some numbers, and those numbers are uh, peak ground accelerations. And uh, if you see a number in purple, it means it's peak ground acceleration, which was obtained by a screening report, the most uh, recent um, hazard evaluation reports is uh, higher than previously uh, assessed uh, the ground acceleration. And there is a lot of site like this. So if we can go to slide number four, please. Can you see number four? Yep. Sure. OK. So this slide, so we had to come up with a new methodology uh, to develop this because it's a number of sites, a number of conditions, and all you know different. So uh, we got help from Dr. Abrahamson and his uh, a company. He worked from SC Solutions. So we collaborate with SC Solution and Dr. Abrahamson for this methodology. And basically, we need to develop spectral shapes and 
amplitudes for different representative conditions. And this view graph show condition in central eastern US. So we came up with three uh, scenarios uh, as a representative for central eastern US scenarios. And uh, an example here, I don't show all examples, but one example here on the top is for central eastern US hard rock horizontal spectral shapes that we developed. And on the bottom is uh, vertical to horizontal ratios, which are based on Dr. Abrahamson vertical to horizontal spectral ratio model. So this is Central Eastern US. So next one, please, number five. Uh, so this is this slide show Western um, US conditions. And for Western US, we also have three scenarios as a representative. And scenario one and two are applicable to soft rock sites such as Diablo Canyon and Hanford. Scenario one and three are applicable to soil sites such as Apollo Verde. Also shown as an as example are horizontal spectral shapes for one of condition, which is soft rock in this case. And also horizontal, vertical to horizontal ratio for soft rock condition, which is a plot on the bottom. Okay, we can now go to slide number six. Yeah, so so we got spectral shapes. So um, we came up with a way to determine which uh, peak ground acceleration of 10 minus four hazard label would be a representative and also how to scale this to five, 10 minus four and five, 10 minus five hazard label. This five, 10 minus five being approximately the safe shutdown earthquake level. So what's shown on these four different plots is pretty much the same information. So on the left, those are peak ground acceleration from screening report for all these corresponding hard rock, for example, in this case, site on the left side. On the right side are developed peak ground accelerations. On the top, it's a 10 minus 5, 10 minus 5 hazard label on the bottom. Uh, right, it's 5, 10 minus 4 hazard label. So as you can see, those two labels encompass uh, screening report peak ground accelerations, except a few points. But the plan is to include these points into our test cases. Uh, next few graph, please. So finally, those are time histories, right? So we developed, we, all together we have nine, nine spectral shapes in Central Eastern US, four spectral shapes in Western US, and five time histories for each of these spectral shapes. So all together, 65 time histories. So uh, because hard rock time histories, uh, free field are the same as shake table motion. So we came up with 55 different test cases for hard rock uh, site condition. And the whisker and box plot uh, show the statistics of these hard rock test cases in terms of the ground accelerations. And next few graph, please. So no, now what are those conditions at soil and soft rock sites? When you, we looked at screening report data, we found out that most sites have very deep soil or soft rock, which is basically exceed 500 meters. And this map depth to hard rock, uh, it's a good illustration of this. So you see a lot like how these green soil sites uh, fall into very, very large or uh, thick area of you know soil or soft rock. So we are talking about very, very deep uh, soil condition. And next slide, please. Uh, so you see slide number nine, right? Yes? Yes. Uh -huh, great. So this is about soil. So now what are soil structure interaction? What we expect to see in terms of soil structure interaction and path flexibility? These are preliminary results of soil structure interaction and pad flexibility. The model considered uh, a pad or dry storage pad on which we had 24 vertical casks. And um, as you can see, we can soil structure the spectral response uh, with in including soil structure interaction is modified uh, compared to free field 
spectral from in a frequency band from one to 10 hertz. Also the behavior or spectral response is different and a different location of the pad with the higher spectral acceleration being in the point uh, and this is a red circle, red point on the pad. So it's edge of the pad had the highest spectral acceleration. This analysis is still on the way, underway, and we will consider uh, all earthquake scenarios and representative soil and soft rock condition to um, understand the, in, the impacts of soil structure interaction and pad flexibility. And this will help us to determine will which point on the pad will be included in the tests or maybe a few points on the pad. So next slide, please. And finally about our test unit. So we were lucky to get an actual uh, canister you, which is used by a uh, utility for dry storage of spent nuclear fuel. And on the top, when it say new home 32 PTH2 canister, that's the canister we got. On the bottom is internals of this canister. 32 refer to 32 assemblies, spent fuel assembly you can put in this basket tubes in, inside this uh, dry storage canister. So dry storage canister usually go inside of uh, like what we called a uh, concrete overpack, which is basically steel and concrete structure. Uh, it's very expensive uh, canister. So we decided to build it ourselves. So in, this is now in production. So we are fabricating our own simplified model of vertical casket will be steel carpus and it will be filled with uh, concrete. So example, uh, which called uh, dummy assembly. Dummy assembly is uh, not actual assembly, it's just simple representation of spent fuel assembly, representation in terms of mass. It's just a steel tube filled with concrete. You will have 20 of those, of those manufactured and it will be put inside dress storage canister. But we will have four, which are very close representation of actual spent fuel assembly, we call it surrogate assemblies as opposed to dummy assemblies. And picture on the right top, uh, on, the, on the right bottom, shows this actual well, surrogate assembly. It's also like real assembly. It will it consists of number of tubes, zircaloy tubes, filled with pellets. But instead of uh, fuel pellets, uh, we use uh, lead pellets. So it's as close as can get without being you know, radioactive stuff. So this is for surrogate assembly will be also inside this dry storage canister. And dry storage canister uh, will go on the top of shaker table for all these tests. And uh, uh, next please. Yeah, so we hope to conduct this te test uh, in uh, LH post facility when it's available. So I hope we, now project is number two in line. When conducting this project, we will uh, put concrete layers on the shake table and we will put two different layers on left and right side to represent different friction. Uh, on one side, it will be probably around 0.5 representative of condition on the pad, or at least medium friction coefficient on a dry storage pad. We will probably go to lower, maybe to 0.25 or something like that. On another side, uh, to representative, less uh, representative condition, but this condition will probably result in some movement of our system on the shake table during the experiments. And uh, finally, uh, my last slide, and it's uh, about instrument instrumentation. So we still have a lot to decide about instrumentation, but we will definitely instrument our uh, vertical uh, cask, vertical overpack, um, our canister basket, and of course, dummy assembly and surrogate assembly. Um, surrogate assembly will also be instrumented with a bunch of strain gauges, which will be located at different places on the roads uh, to capture the behavior during test. And we are thinking about probably 300 
channels all together, but the results, so the instrumentation will be developed better when we know more about results of the test modeling. And now I will, uh, this is uh, end of my presentation and Nick clinician will describe the pretest modeling results. And then I, uh, we will take uh, questions because it's basically related to the same test. I hope it will be the best. So thank you very much. And um, that's conclude my presentation. Thank you very much, Elena. And I think you will be follow. Yeah, Nick. Okay, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes. Thank you. I'm Nick Clemission from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, I'm responsible for a lot of the modeling, the numerical modeling that goes into the, the test and what will happen after the test. Uh, I am reusing this slide deck from a, a previous meeting. I hope you're not offended, but uh, I think it fits pretty well. So uh, this first slide is kind of introducing some of the modeling that we're doing at PNNL. Over on the, the far right is uh, the cask level model on top, top of a, a shake table pad. And inside the, the red cask is the canister, which is in yellow. Inside the canister is a basket. And inside the basket are 32 fuel assemblies. As Elena said, we're gonna have dummy assemblies for most of them in the test, and then four uh, good surrogate assemblies that were instrumented with strain gauges and accelerometers so we can measure the response of the fuel assemblies as they respond to the earthquake, the simulated earthquake. Um, kind of in the middle, I've got a, a, a sketch of the a, a fuel assembly inside a, a basket cell so the model gets very big, very complicated and takes a long time to run. So we have different levels of model and the fully detailed fuel assembly where we've looked at most in this um, program is inside a single basket cell. It's pulled out of, uh, and the basket cell is, um, the movements of the basket cell are predicted by the cask level model. So a sub-modeling um, approach. Um, another thing about this slide is uh, it, it refers to a, a freely available report. If you're interested in this sort of modeling, um, you can download it from, uh, uh, from the DOE OSTI site. And uh, if you do look at it, note that in that report, we were looking at a hazard level of 1e to the minus 5 annual frequency of exceedance but as I'll discuss a bit more in a couple of slides, we're looking more at the 5e e to the minus 5 and 5e e to the minus 4 hazard levels now. So um, I have a, a few slides of results to show from a low resolution model. And that's this model on the right. It, uh, it doesn't have, uh, all the details inside the um, canister, but it, it runs relatively quickly. The, um, the more detailed model I showed on the previous slide of the cask system, that takes about 90 hours to run for 50 seconds of solution time. So this model that I'm talking about here, it runs a lot, a lot faster in a few hours on a typical desktop. And one of the things we're always looking for is ways to simplify the modeling so we can use um, the smallest model that's effective in giving us the results we're interested in. So these first results um, come from a earthquake um, uh, with some details uh, up in the, the header. Can't see them but it's a, um, a hard rock site with a 5e to the minus five hazard level. And um, I think it's a 5.5 magnitude earthquake that has an epicenter 15 kilometers away. And um, this, this set of results is looking at the contact pressure of the cask uh, applying pressure to the pad. And that's what the, the contours are showing. In the upper right 
is a moment in time when the system is at rest and you can see the contact pressure is nicely distributed in a nice circle. It's a, a ring pattern because the weight of the cask is primarily on the edges. It's an annulus kind of shape. Um, and then below that slide is a moment in time during the earthquake response where the, um, uh, the, the cask is moving a little bit. And you can see that the, the pressure changes where on the leading edge, the, um, the cask is, is pushing down on the edge and on the, the back end, the pressure is getting less. And so one of the things we're worried about in the test is the possibility of the cask tipping over. And so with this type of modeling, we're, we wanna understand what conditions are gonna cause the cask to tip over. Let's see. Another thing we're looking at is the friction and what the effective friction coefficient has on the, the potential sliding of the cask. There's a historical example at the North Iron Nuclear Power Station where an earthquake caused casks like these to slide on their pads. And um, uh, in, in that case, they moved somewhere in the range of four to six inches. Can't remember what that was, but uh, um, in this case for this earthquake that's uh, being modeled, um, I looked at two cases of friction, a 0.2 static friction on the left, 0.5 static friction on the right, and I'm plotting the, the lateral contact force divided by the cask weight. So for the blue curve, if it's over 20%, it indicates sliding. If it's below negative 20%, it indicates sliding in the opposite direction. And in that case of low friction, um, about five millimeters of sliding was calculated. In the higher friction case, the orange curve, um, it needs to get above 50% or below negative 50% for sliding. And in this case, there was no sliding. So as we're going into the test, we wanna do pretest predictions of all of the cases where we think sliding might happen to um, uh, see see if we're right and, and take, uh, take precautions if uh, we think there's gonna be a problem. So the hazard levels, you know, I think this crew, this audience knows about hazard levels, the annual frequency of the exceedance and return periods, but we're looking at this a little bit differently than is normal for, for seismic engineering. We're trying to quantify what happens to the spent fuel in a cask. We're not worried about safety. The casks are, are assured to be safe. They are evaluated for very strong earthquakes. And the question we have is whether or not the fuel is gonna get broken inside the cask during an earthquake. And so if you look at the 100 years of dry storage and um, look at the hazard level of 5e to the minus five, there's only a 0.5% chance that that'll be exceeded in 100 years or a 99.5% chance that it isn't. If you go down to the 5e to the minus four, that's about a 5% chance of happening in 100 years. And so when we do this test, we really wanna find what are the loads, what are the probabilities of the loads happening? And this isn't your typical you know, typical seismic engineering um, application. So, uh, yeah, I, I just had a few slides. Um, you know, one thing to note is that we are planning to model the test configuration with all of the actual shake table inputs. Right now we're working on the hard rock sites because we have those shake table inputs and we're gonna start on the soft rock and soil sites when we get that information um, from SC Solutions, our contractor. Uh, we're looking at contact pressure and friction as two key modeling phenomena that we think the testing is gonna help us model these things better. Um, and we're gonna keep, keep doing the pretest modeling and we're gonna keep looking for the minimum numerical model that'll, that is useful for us to use. 
And last thing, I just want to acknowledge, I have a lot of uh, good staff members at PNNO on my team helping me build on these models and things. And um, I, I'm ready to help take questions if uh, you have any. Thank you very much, Nick. So do we have any question for Elena and Nick? Please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to speak and ask your question, or if you'd prefer to just type it in the chat or the Q&A, go right ahead. Okay. Maybe one question. What uh, what is the longest duration that you know these uh, nuclear casks have been uh, you know standing on slab in front of nuclear power plants in the U.S. Boy, uh, 40 years, 20 years or 40 years, Elena, do you know? They've, they've just started a, um, a process. They weren't intended to sit at the sites for so long, but they have been sitting there. And they've started a new process of visual inspecting these casks every X number of years to make sure that there's no stress corrosion cracking happening or other type of corrosion and things. So it's something like 20 or 40 years, I think. Mm -hmm. Elena, do you know? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I lost sound again. So yes, it was uh, like, uh, yeah, like probably first dry storage uh, started in 1996. So that's the first uh, dry storage uh, in the US. Mm -hmm. Have some of those been subjected to uh, earthquakes, small earthquakes, and are some of them instrumented in case there is a small earthquake or any earthquake? They're not instrumented that I know of. They, they have been subjected to some earthquakes, like at the North Anna nuclear power plant. Um, the casks moved, but there was not any significant damage that needed to be repaired to the casks. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we have a, a, a hand raised. Uh, I have allowed you, uh, Davide, to unmute. Hello. Hello, Davide Gorini, Sapienza University of Rome. And uh, I would have a question for, for Elena. First of all, I uh, thank you for, uh, for the very interesting presentation and work. And actually, uh, I would only like to, to ask for uh, some more detail about the evaluation of the source structure interaction effects in characterizing the seismic demand for, for the analysis. Uh, yes. So, and what is the question? Yeah, uh, I would only like to uh, to have some uh, some more details about the uh, the evaluation of the soil structure interaction effects in characterizing the seismic demand uh, for uh, for the structure analysis. Uh, Kurosh, could could you could you unmute me on the phone? Uh, sure. Okay, you should be able to unmute uh, on your phone, Elena. Okay, Th thank you. Sorry for all this. Uh, okay. as, so it's, uh, it's hard to answer uh, shortly this question because it's ongoing work. So uh, and, uh, at this point, we have a representative profiles and the data are based, the data I showed you are roughly based, the profile is based on Voctel nuclear power plant studies. So because Voctel recently, you know, they, they are looking at licensing to new units and they did a very detailed research about, you know, soil condition and the site. So, and another site where we'll be looking at it's fairly. So 
unfortunately, nuclear power plants, you know, they license, they got their license long time ago. And that's why it's a lot of data are not really great. So it's, they are roughly based on some every suggestion and basically that's it. So we were looking everywhere for good set of new data. And we found a couple NPPs with such a data. So the profiles are based on this new data, very good data. And um, so, and we also will be looking at different paths because what I show you, it's not necessarily, I mean, the dry storage paths are different. So it will be different configurations and they will be also differently loaded because it's not like they put, you know, cask on the pod and it's full. No, they put it, you know, in a different campaign. So it starts fooling and it may take like years to fool it until it's fully loaded. So all this is considered, you know, in this. So in terms of calculation ability, we, at this point we use SASI and it's just, you know, we, uh, and Nick will take these results and because SASI will not give you, you know, it's, it's not like it can do uh, movement of the cask, but the cask is fixed on the pad and we're looking at this configuration with SASI, you know, basically for propagation. We have a, we are using as an input the free field motions for soil and um, soft rock we, we got from our free field analysis. So those are go as a boundary condition. And the, that's what we, you know, that's what is deconvoluted as a boundary condition and the bottom of the soil layer. Yeah, so, and again, if you are interested, we will have a full report sometime in uh, maybe February, which will describe all uh, research done in the soil structure interaction in support of this work. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. Uh, there's another question that came through in the uh, Q&A. Um, here we go. Considering the nonlinear table specimen interaction, how do you ensure that the actuator forces reaches a maximum value or not? In other words, how do you predict the effect of changes in specimen characteristics and other sources of nonlinearities on the actuator force to ensure the table's capability in doing the test? Maybe I will make an attempt to answer this question. Uh, like I mentioned a little bit yesterday, we, are, we had developed a model for the 1D LH post, uh, you know, including the, you know, all the servo hydraulic, the servo valve, the flow in the servo valve, the actuators, the, the platen, the, the friction and dissipative forces, and, and even the, the, the coupling with some, some specimen. And we, we are now extending this model with a PhD student for the, for the six degree of freedom LH post. And we will soon reach the point where we can interface this model, let's say, with a payload, a nonlinear model of payload in open seas, for example, and, and do a pretest simulation of the whole system, including the, the interaction between the payload and, you know, in the table. And this would allow us to, to, to detect in advance if we are going to reach some limits like that. Now, I don't know if we, in this case, will be ready you know, to interface this with a with a nonlinear model of a, of a nuclear cask, but maybe we will. And if not, you know, we we have a lot of interlocking. Uh, we have many, you know, many many way to detect a physical limit of of the platen of the shake table system. And when we reach one of these limits, you know, there, there is a there is a e uh, there is an abort a soft abort of the test. Now in the case of, uh, of course, if it's a, a structural, a building specimen or, or something like that, the, uh, the abort could be, uh, you know, uh, damaging the specimen in an unwanted way and so on. That's why for, for building specimen, we, we, we will have to put a lot of effort into detecting this in advance with the, the tool that I just mentioned, for example. Uh, for, for a nuclear cask, if we do an abort, we will probably not damage the specimen in my opinion. And 
we will just you know uh, learn from it and 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 maybe change the kind of the earthquake that we will play the next time around i don't know if it answers your your question thank you okay any other questions uh anybody want to raise their hands or put their questions in the q a or the chat and we'll get to them All right, no more questions. So let's go to the last but not least presentation by Dr. Kurosh Lotfizadeh. Uh, he got his PhD in our department with Professor Estrepo and, and uh, became now the site operation manager. So Kurosh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, let me put this uh, on the screen. I hope everyone can see uh, the presentation. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us in our workshop, uh, spending time here uh, listening to us. Uh, I'm just going to briefly, I'll try to keep it quick, uh, go over the IT resources, the cybersecurity instrumentation data acquisition that we have available at our site here for use. Uh, just to quickly uh, go over the personnel that we have, uh, I know we uh, mentioned yesterday uh, but just to recap, um, here's the organization chart of our facility. Uh, Professor Conte is the PI of the facility. Uh, he's responsible for site administration. Professor Mosqueda uh, is a co-PI responsible for site, administ uh, site performance. Uh, Professor Shing, site operations. Uh, Professor Hutchinson, uh, user services. Professor Van den Eyde, education and community outreach. Uh, they're all you know, responsible for their individual respective areas. We have uh, Professor Luco and Professor Estrepo, who are uh, their pers senior personnel, who are uh, experts in geotechnical uh, and soil structure interaction and uh, shake table experiments. And they bring their expertise to tests that we do here at site. Um, we have two uh, shake table uh, operators, uh, myself and Abdullah Hamid. Um, we also have a, an IT manager who is responsible for all the cybersecurity and uh, IT resources that we have available here. So a lot of what you'll see in my presentation, uh, it's this gentleman here that's uh, responsible for. And we have uh, Alex Sherman, our site foreman, safety coordinator, also very critical. And uh, Jeremy Fitcher, our development technician at our site available uh, to assist in all research activities here. So about the IT infrastructure and cybersecurity, what we have at our site, uh, we use a UPS, a, a pretty large UPS to provide a uh, clean power to the data acquisition it, uh, and it provides a buffer in the event of a power outage. Uh, we don't want things to go crazy or the shake table controller to to fail in case there is a power outage here. We have offsite data backup uh, for redundancy of all data that uh, comes through here. That's uh, also test data or documentation. Uh, every, every piece of information, we have a, a redundant backup server. Both keep copies uh, in-house and you know, offsite uh, in case there is an event on site where uh, data could be lost. Uh, we have cybersecurity audits, the, the university IT department uh, in collaboration with our IT manager, uh, uh, Mr. Beckley. Uh, they do weekly audits on our, uh, our infrastructure here, our cyber infrastructure. They do security audits and uh, network vulnerability scanning and penetration testing to make sure that our, our network is secure. And of course, you know, we got security cameras and locks for physical security. All of our sensors, instrumentation, our data acquisition, they're always in locked uh, spaces and uh, access to them, physical access to them is restricted at all times to key personnel. Um, our facility is equipped with gigabit ethernet throughout the, the site, you know, in all of our offices and all the rooms, the conference rooms, we have uh, gigabit ethernet and we have secure high-speed Wi-Fi throughout the facility in areas that, you know, we might be portable, mobile, uh, and need to have access to the internet. Um, we have two separate networks of uh, IT, you know, networks. Uh, one is the general facility network that's uh, connected to the internet, and that's what users would use. You could get on it with your cell phone, your laptop, or you know, your desktop, whatever device you have. But 
we have a secondary network where our data acquisition or our video uh, processing and uh, collection uh, servers are on. And this uh, this network is not on the internet. It is you know restricted to key personnel. It's not accessible from anywhere. And these are two diagrams just kind of from the past, just to give you an idea of the two separate networks that we have, where you have your uh, open, if you will, or, or accessible uh, network, which is throughout the entire facility. And then you have our, our separate intranet uh, for the data acquisition systems and video systems as well. At our site, we uh, have real-time monitoring for a lot of the subsystems that we have here. Uh, we have uh, several large accumulator banks that uh, Professor Conte presented earlier uh, yesterday. In case you missed it, I would highly recommend uh, watching the video once we publish them in the Google Drive or uh, just review the presentation slides that has very, very good information in it. Um, our large accumulator banks are where we uh, pressurize the, the hydraulic fluid that uh, moves the uh, actuators uh, for the shake table. It uh, consists of 75 large bottles. There's a 130 gallon capacity each. So they're pressurized with uh, nitrogen up to 3000 PSI each in its idle conditions. And when we want to uh, start running tests, we increase that pressure to 5000 PSI. And that's where we can release that uh, fluid to the actuators. Now, the pressure in these bottles will change uh, throughout the day due to ambient, vibra uh, ambient temperature fluctuations. So you get you know, a pretty uh, noticeable swing in the pressure and the nitrogen in each of these bottles. So to keep an eye on that and make sure that the, uh, the pressures are where we want them to be and we don't have uh, some certain bottles being too high pressure or too low pressure. Uh, and also for leak detection mitigation, we have uh, wireless sensor nodes uh, installed on each of these bottles where we monitor the pressure and the temperature and several metrics within each bottle wirelessly in real time. And uh, we have our own in-house server that captures all this data and we can do historical trend um, uh, statistics on it as needed. And it has a simple web interface uh, so we can monitor it either look locally or remote if needed. Uh, here, just to give you an example where you can see the, uh, the pressure and uh, the pressure changes over uh, throughout the day, the course of the day, uh, along with the temperature and you know several metrics that we do record. Along um, the lines of real-time system, subsystem monitoring, we also have a cooling system, a pretty large cooling tower that um, monitors, uh, has sensors throughout the system, monitoring the oil temperature, the water temperature, uh, all making sure that our equipment is functioning properly um, and keeping temperatures in a reasonable, within, uh, within a reasonable and desired temperature for operation. Um, this system is also being monitored, and uh, again, these are all systems that are on the, uh, the internal network where you won't be able to access them. So we're not at risk of uh, any uh, security breaches from you know, the external, external security breaches. Um, this is just to show you, uh, I, I kind of redacted a couple of little pieces of information here, but to show you the types of uh, interfaces that we have there. We also uh, have, uh, we make use of uh, an MTS system called Echo Health Monitoring to monitor the health uh, of our HPUs, the, uh, the large uh, pumps that pressurize the oil uh, that we need to run the system. Uh, this uh, Echo Monitoring uh, is for real-time monitoring of the, the HPUs. Um, it, it minimizes system downtime. We can catch problems in advance before things get uh, out of control if there are any problems and uh, we can prevent a lot of potential catastrophic events. Uh, it monitors various uh, metrics, critical metrics, so that the temperature in each of these pumps, uh, the heat exchanger water saturation, if there is any kind of uh, water leaking from the heat exchanger, we don't want the water and the oil to mix, uh, that would contaminate the, uh, the, the fluid. Uh, it checks for fluid contamination, not only for the water saturation, but also for particulates uh, in case one of the filters has, uh, has gone bad or has uh, reached its end of life. We want to make sure that the, uh, the quality of our hydraulic fluid is still uh, in tip top shape so we don't damage any of the uh, highly sensitive equipment that we have on site. Now, all of this is also on um, our local server, but they do have a back end where you can access it from any mobile device. That goes through, I believe it's an Amazon uh, AWS 
uh, server, but that has SSL 256-bit uh, encryption. So we're not very concerned about uh, external uh, intrusions in this system. Uh, as far as the instrumentation and our data acquisition system, so our main objectives uh, at our site is to provide data from experimental work that's in, typically and most often they're very expensive. They take years to set up, years to uh, develop, uh, get funding for, and then you know do the test. Uh, so you really only get one shot at any kind of experimental work you do. And our primary objective is to provide accurate, reliable, and good, clean data from these experiments to the researchers. So we have a, a whole host of uh, instruments, and I'll kind of briefly go over that in the next slide. Uh, we perform in-house calibrations. Uh, so we have right here, you can see some photos of some of the equipment we use for calibrating these various sensors. Um, we, we have um, Everything is well documented. We have a master log for our documentation, a um, whole bunch of general documentation, documentation, standard operating procedures documentation, all of that in-house calibration. Uh, they're all documented well, uh, and this is mainly done for our uh, IAS accreditation. We have to have uh, this uh, documentation um, readily available and very well cataloged. Uh, we have a sensor inventory system that uh, keep track when we keep track of each individual sensor with their own tracking numbers. Um, uh, of course, we have an equipment inventory as well for all the uh, various tools and pieces of equipment that we have. And of course, as I mentioned, the calibration reports are always available as well. As far as the instrumentation that we have available, we, uh, uh, I believe Professor Conte briefly touched upon this uh, yesterday, in case you missed it, we have you know, over 200 MEMS-based accelerometers. Some of them, uh, a handful of them are uh, plus minus 5G uh, range. Uh, with most of them are uh, plus or minus 10G range. We have over 140 linear tr displacement transducers that vary from two inches to 20 inches. Uh, about 120 string potentiometers, again, going from two inches to 60 inches. Uh, we have load jacks, uh, some load cells for capacities up to 20,000 pounds, uh, soil pressure transducers. We currently have a GPS system to, to monitor uh, the, the dynamically monitor uh, the displacements and structures. And we have uh, three receivers currently, and we're developing a new system that's going to have uh, higher capabilities. Uh, we have a, our current system has three receivers. One will be used for reference and the, the two would be the mobile receivers. They operate at 50 hertz. Um, and uh, this GPS systems are very, very important. And if you can imagine, you know, on a 10 story building, how would you measure the displacements at the top? Uh, you'd need a very tall reference column if you didn't use uh, GPS systems. So uh, that's available to the researchers here. We have a whole host of cameras, uh, we've got drones, uh, DJI Phantom 4 Pro drones, uh, uh, and also the DJI, I believe Mavic is the model. Uh, we have a lot of GoPro cameras, a whole bunch of IP cameras and coax cameras that uh, connect to our uh, live streaming uh, service. We have a, a live streaming system that's, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot to keep going here. Uh, we have a live streaming uh, system that uh, doesn't have any latency or very, very low latency. So you get to stream the, uh, the experiments in real time uh, through various platforms. It has its own dedicated platform. And also we can go on uh, all the social media sites, uh, Facebook, YouTube, you know, anywhere that provide uh, streaming capabilities. All of our uh, video uh, systems are triggered through the same triggering mechanism that our data acquisition are triggered at. And I'll talk about that in just a second, um, where when you start the test, it will simultaneously start recording data and the video. So synchronizing the video and the, uh, the data is uh, substantially easier and less cumbersome for the researcher. Uh, that, that there is one exception to that, the GoPros aren't so easy to synchronize with the data that would have to happen manually. So our data acquisition system, um, we used to have uh, a data acquisition system that was incredibly reliable, very high quality uh, from national instruments. Now that has been serving us well for the past 15-ish years of operation at this facility. Uh, it's now considered to be obsolete. It's been uh, uh, discontinued and finding replacement parts for it. As, as we lose uh, channels as they, you know, 
break or stop functioning properly, it's difficult to bring those back to, to life. Uh, finding replacement components are just not, not really a feasible option. So we were uh, one of the three selected for, from the university for an MRI proposal. Uh, it's a very highly competitive uh, uh, proposal uh, to get a new data acquisition system. We uh, were awarded this uh, MRI and uh, we have purchased our components for our new data acquisition system. And we expect this to serve us for the next uh, 15 years. Uh, it consists of 12 nodes, and I'll show on the next slide what each node looks like. Uh, each node has 64 channel capability. Uh, it, all the channels can be uh, assigned to any type of uh, instrument. Uh, if it's a strain gauge or an accelerometer or displacement transducer, whatever, we can always uh, assign them to each channel. So there's 64 channels in each node. That's 24-bit analog to digital resolution and it can sample up to 25,000 samples per second uh, per channel uh, simultaneous sampling as opposed to multiplexing. And it's readily scalable. Uh, we can uh, modify, uh, try to add different types of sensors. If you have a specific sensor in mind for your project, we can incorporate that into our data acquisition system. And uh, it, this, with this new data acquisition system, we can continue uh, providing that critical uh, data that I mentioned earlier. So to look at what each node of this data acquisition system consists of, uh, we have a chassis. Uh, these are all components from National Instruments, by the way. Um, we have a, a chassis. Each node has a controller, which has a quad-core processor, um, very high-end uh, computing capability. Um, and this controls the, the data acquisition and signal conditioning modules. And each node has eight modules inside it. And I'm only showing one in this diagram, but there's eight of them in here. And these uh, modules are each connected to uh, a rack mount uh, terminal block. Um, and these terminal blocks are where you would plug in your sensors. The, the sensors are now gonna be plugged in using a high-speed uh, RJ50 cables that can transfer uh, quite a bit of data um, simultaneously as we want. Uh, all these nodes are connected to a, uh, a local intranet uh, through ethernet. Um, so in this diagram, you can see we have the 12 nodes. Each node connects to three of those terminal blocks. So we have this entire system and they're all set up on one network where they can communicate with each other uh, and they all get triggered through the same uh, system as I mentioned with the video recorder. So the shake table controller, there's an output line from that, that gets split off into the video recorder and the 12 nodes. So as you begin and end uh, an experiment, uh, the data is captured simultaneously through all nodes. Just to give you an idea of what the software looks like in its current stage. We're still in development of this. Uh, some, some updates have been made, uh, so you, can, you can't see the, uh, the full extent of it. And you won't really get to get an idea of what this is unless you're operating it, uh, just putting these out there. So you have an idea. All the programming is done in lab view. Uh, this is just a snapshot from one of the, the, the sub VIs. I mean, there's dozens of sub VIs if you've ever done any programming in lab view. Um, you will know that this is really showing you nothing, <laughs> but just to give you an idea. Aside from that, uh, we'll, we have uh, two websites that you can find a whole bunch of information about our facility, our capabilities, and uh, all the available resources. Uh, the first is the Design Safe UCSD page, and this can be accessed by going to either ucsd.designsafe-ci.org or just going to the Design Safe website where they have a link to our page. Uh, at the top, there's a navigation toolbar where you can find a whole bunch of information. Um, the links to the workshop videos and materials will be here, uh, equipment portfolio, you know, all the, all the things that you, you want. And also we have our own uh, website that's not through Design Safe. Uh, similar material is published in both locations. We try to keep them uh, in sync. Uh, we have a presence on social media. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, you know, YouTube, LinkedIn, wherever um, you, you go for social media. Uh, we do broadcast uh, our tests uh, online, live streaming them, and we do publish information, you know, post them on our social media of upcoming uh, events. So please keep an eye out for that. 
Uh, these slides will be shared with all the other slides, so you can just have these links with you. Uh, again, on our website, we have the similar you know, navigation toolbar. There's one cool thing here is where you can see the live stream of uh, daily activities at the LH Post 6. So it's just cameras. We have three cameras on this slide here. You can only see one shot, but we have three cameras constantly live streaming. So even if you log on right now, you can see what we're doing out there during the upgrade project. And uh, in the interest of time, uh, I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we do have a uh, workshop survey. It would greatly help us if you will fill out our survey. Uh, just give us some feedback. It's completely anonymous. Uh, you can e leave your email if you want us to contact you. If there's any questions you have, uh, we'd we'll be happy to address them. Uh, it, it'll help. Your feedback will help us uh, improve the delivery of future workshops. Uh, you can, I'll put this link in the chat. I already put it earlier, but I'll put the link in the chat and have a QR code if you want to scan that. Uh, if you don't mind just taking a few minutes uh, and filling out the survey will greatly help us. And with that, I, uh, I'll, I'll keep the slide on the screen. Uh, I'll come back to it in a second. But with that, I am done with my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gurosh. So do we have any question? Uh about this part of the workshop or previous presentation from today or yesterday. Yes, uh, I will be uh, sharing this presentation as well. Uh, it's gonna maybe take me a day or two to compile everything and fully uh, upload all the materials to the Google Drive. Uh, I will do that and I'll send an email to all, all the attendees uh, when everything is up online. Currently, uh, some of the material has already been posted to the uh, Google Drive, and uh, I'll send one when everything is posted as well. I think Andre has a question. Yes, Andre. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks. This was a good update. Um, Kurush and, and you know, PI is there. I was wondering in terms of high-end GPS, high-resolution GPS, did you guys purchase something new or, you know, historically, but it's been what, 15 years since I was there um, looking at the shake table. Um, there, there was, you know, special GPS units that we could borrow. Um, do you have anything of the sort now? I mean, we, we are now, Andre, in the process of uh, deciding what to do with the GPS, uh, updating, upgrading what we had before and extending it or, or coming up with something uh, something new so we we will have probably some news in in january about that okay great thank you i just uh put the uh the link uh, in the the chat as well for the survey so if you have a moment to fill that out everyone we'd greatly appreciate it I do see another question that came in in the Q&A. Uh, is the drone video also synchronized? Uh, no, the drone video, good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, the drone video, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a good clever mechanism for automatically synchronizing it. Uh, there are techniques you can use to synchronize them using uh, maybe a blinking light or something to, uh, to capture uh, the start point. Uh, so you can have a reference point, a uh, reference slide, if you will, or frame. Um, but it, it is not. To answer your question, the drone video is not uh, automatically synchronized. And of course, the, the UAV is GPS timestamped. So it's a mechanism you can use to synchronize with analog data. Yes, that can also be. Uh, the, the, the issue with that would be that the data acquisition system is not on the internet. So we use a local NTP yeah, it's server. An, it's an after, yeah, it's an right. after processing step, yes. yes. Any other questions? No, all right. So, so it looks like we are at the end of the workshop. So I would like to, uh, to thank all the speakers for your excellent presentation and the 
all the attendees for, for your interest in our, in our workshop. I hope that you, the attendees, have obtained the kind of information that you were looking for. And you also had a chance to, to meet, at least virtually, the, the Neri at UC San Diego team. So please feel free to contact any of us. Maybe let me put on the screen here. Oh, yes. the... I'll stop sharing this. <laughs> there we go. It's all yours. Yeah, let me just put, uh, let's see here, I think. Okay, no, all right, uh, let's see. Sorry about that. Where was this? Oh, here, okay. All right, so I put all the email here on the screen and two papers that may be of interest to you that I, I mentioned during the presentation and the questions. And uh, yeah, so please feel free to contact any of us for question regarding specimen or feasibility of test or uh, test procedures, test protocol and so on. And uh, we, we wish you the very best with the preparation of your NSF proposal, those of you who, who will do that and look forward to work with you. I uh, also would like to to have a special thanks for Kurosh, who did a, an excellent job in the logistic organization of, of this workshop. Thank you, Kurosh. And uh, as he mentioned, please do not forget to fill the surveys. They, they are very valuable for us. And we wish you all uh, you know, to stay safe and healthy and wish you a happy uh, Christmas holidays. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Happy Thank holidays, you. everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Good work, Karush. Thank See you. you. <laughs> See you. Thank you. Bye.